because they're in really good voice, they could sing Happy Birthday as well. No, it would, would be out of tune. <laughs> oh, right. So Dave has a big smile on his face. <laughs> and I hope the spectators up the hill are waving because Dave does a fantastic job as uh, course controller. Nothing gets past his, his beady eye. Right, do wave as he comes through now, please. That'd be really great. Well, yes. thank you very much indeed. Yeah, well done, Dave. Come That's on, Bonham's yes. tent. Thank you very much. <laughs> wave away. <laughs> they're not listening to you. No, no, they're, they're doing okay. I mean, it was weak, but it, you know, it wasn't quite like a football crowd or latest weekend. I, 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 should, uh, I should hope not. <laughs> Do you think it's fair to give Piers another practice run? He'll probably lock yeah, four, why not? four seconds of his best time. Yeah, I can see if I can get a better wave then. Oh, actually, the course car is immediately behind. Bit efficient, aren't we, really? But uh, if you're if you're here at Prescott, do have a look at this car in the paddock, up parked up in the Bugatti uh, car park near the restaurant. It is just a delight to see, beautifully made. All the little uh, nickel-plated fixtures and fittings made by Pierce himself. <coughs> it's a real work of art. And he's being accoladed. You said a little early on. He's being invited down to London to go to Hampton Court. Yes, and he's winning an award. Quite rightly so. Young Engineer of the Year, which is yep. which is great. And uh, Piers' dad, Charles, was long-time chairman of the club here. And good to see him here and in good health. Exceedingly. Telling some of his wonderful stories of his early career as a helicopter. Pilot. And his mum, who raced at uh, Le Mans. And you did a, a, an after-dinner speech upon that, did you not? No, I think uh, Charles himself gave a talk. <laughs> You're quite right. I think quite he gave right. a talk. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. No, uh, you remember, I had an evening with Henry Cole in the clubhouse. That was, that was such fun. He's a great uh, biker. And uh, he, r he has a TV show called The Motorbike Show. And a, a delightful character. We, now we've opened the clubhouse under the control and authority of the Bugatti Owners Club. Um, Steve, who is part and parcel of the council, is putting together some more events for the both season ahead and the spring of next year. And we'd like to join with the Vintage Sports Car Club in those invitations. So we're putting together some names that will ring true with all of us and uh, storytelling. So uh, we'll be circulating that as, as the season progresses to ask you and come and join us and enjoy an evening in the clubhouse with, we hope, some fun talks and films. And I guess the restaurant will be resurrected pretty soon? It is indeed. We've managed to put some uh, care and careful collective money into it. Um, obviously, last year it was, it was a no-go area. So this year we've been quietly and exploring the opportunities. And uh, we've now appointed caterers. And uh, we'll start... Well, this is obviously a cracking weekend to see how it all works. And I hope you've all enjoyed the food and the hospitality in there. And it was nice to see you after the uh, the final run yesterday in there and celebrating and enjoying food and drinks and um, having laughter, which is great to hear the clubhouse full of laughter once again. So makes, thank you for your support. Makes such a difference. It's the sort of building that needs to be full of people. Absolutely correct. We've had two. We've had two lovely parties there, um, celebrating golden wedding and my big birthday, and. They were terrific. We've got a car coming to the line. It's right. A, it's an Austin Chummy, and my guess is that it is Millie Bayliss in her 1927 Austin Chummy. Classic four-seater, although I wouldn't call the rear seats exactly capacious. But uh, mum and dad and the two kids, a nice civilised way of transporting. Cars were incredibly expensive in those days, and so it was really you know, quite a thing for a car to, uh, a family to own a car of any kind.
I don't know what an Austin 7 cost new in 1927. Probably 225 pounds and 16 pence. Yeah, something like that. But the really early ones had their headlights uh, near the windscreen. Uh, and uh, Millie's is a perfect example. Looking at photographs of my grandfather when he qualified at Birmingham University as a doctor and he opened his first practice in 2010, he had a pony and trap. Wow. Millie's first timed run, her time was 75.6 against a fairly tough handicap of 70 seconds. So let's see how she gets on on her second run. She's safely round Pardon, heading up the top road towards the S's. And in sparkling sunshine. Isn't that good? Let's hope it stays. She's followed by Mark Gold in a similar car, but we're focusing on Millie's nice, chummy Austin 7. Middle 750cc, two bearing crankshaft engine, producing, I don't know, 15 horsepower or so, but enough to take the family down to the seaside. With those wonderful advertising that you saw in British Railways, it wasn't British Railways, then those wonderfully evocative come to Brighton or come to uh, Seaton, don't they all? Skegness is oh, so bracing. Exactly, Skegness is so, is so bracing. They're wonderful. Um, Millie's time was this, this time at 73.79, so still quite a long way outside her handicap, but getting better. Mark Gold exits Tom Rote corner, bouncing up and down. Is that the effect of the car on him, or is he trying to urge the car on? Soft springs, possibly? I think so, or bouncy seat. Uh, Mark is again a 70 second handicap, but he's three seconds beyond it, 73.03. Next up is number three, Nicholas Coates. Here he is hurling the little Austin EA into an out of. It looks like the predecessor to the Ulster, doesn't it, with its pointed tail? Yes, I think as you said this morning, Chris, it, it's difficult to work out what all the variations are. Sure. But as you earlier said, from uh, Pony Club to Austin, it's probably a similar seat to sit your bottom upon. But Nicholas, 63.59, and Nicholas's handicap was 64. So he's on inside his handicap, which is a good achievement. Here's the nippy. In the hands of Sarah Foster, Nippy with its characteristic um, curved rear of the bodywork. Talking about the car. And preceding her was Julia Wollstoneholm, number four, it, with a time of 58.95 against a handicap of 62. So she was well inside her handicap. We failed to find out what EA referenced in an Austin 7 for you, I'm afraid. We'll make it up. Extra e adrenaline. <laughs> good one, good one. So Sarah with the, with the nippy. She's facing a 62 second handicap and is just beyond it with a 64.01. How long do you think it took to put the roof up on those little nippies? Someone's tapped me on the shoulder. Hang on. Well, I think, Nick, you probably avoided putting the putting the, the hood up as much as you possibly could because once you've got it up, you probably couldn't get into it or, or actually drive it. Maybe the summers were a little better than the ones we're presently experiencing, then. Well, I think they haven't got global warming, warming have they? I was going to avoid the dreaded word. Mind you, we're going to have a completely discussion in uh, Glasgow later on this year. They're all the politicians in the world are going to put it all right for us. Richard Butterworth has finished and his time was 61.96. Now we've got young Archie Collins in the Ulster replica. Our youngest competitor here today, Archie is just over 16. You can get a competition license at 16, although the Jun Janetta Juniors, 
who have their series highly competitive. A lot of them are about 14, aren't they? Anyway, apparently next year we can invite young, younger boys between 12 and 14 to the hill. Oh, great. Under the police authority and teach them how to drive. Excellent. 57.44 for Archie and his handicap was 60, so he's well inside as well. Um, my computer isn't calculating the difference, the percentage difference between handicap and actual time, so I can't tell you at the moment who has beaten their handicap by the, the largest margin. Meanwhile, Oscar Dobbin, this is the first of our Ulsters, pointed tail, classic, sporty, Austin 7. What would the equivalent nowadays be of a nice, cheap, sporty car to go? Master? The AMX 5, probably. Excellent value. MG, MGF or MGTF. They get, it, they get expensive, don't they? Well, do you remember a couple of years ago at the, the Pomeroy Trophy, a group of young members of the VSC C, all um, had a competition to 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 um, enter an MGF that should cost them no more than 750 quid, and they did. I think there were eight of them, and they had enormous fun. The following year, they followed it up with Volvos. I oh, think did they, they had to be a thousand pounds. One of them cheated, had to have a brand new set of tires, which was 800 pounds plus a thousand pounds. So he was excluded from the race. Quite right. Number 10, Oscar Dobbin, finished with a 61.62. So. Archie's quickest on scratch and possibly also on handicap so far. Here's Stephen Jones in a white Ulster. No, it's not white, it's a sort of creamy colour, isn't it? Can't see it yet, liquid bit. But going as some good lick round the S's. Is it leave? No, it's red to us, Christopher, not grey at all. No, you're looking at a different car. <laughs> or your colour blind, one of the two. Is it legal to have your number plate at an oblique angle at the back? Because if it is, I'm going to shift mine onto the side of the car so the cameras don't pick it up. Fren French cars you can, I'm not sure about English cars. I, I think they've got to catch you first. <laughs> in an old nippy of a home. Uh, Les Gordon time in number 11, 71.16. Steve Jones, number 9, 62.65. Louis Parkin, here he is, just going round the semicircle. And a very hot, bright orange Austin 7 is on the start line. We'll see it very shortly. That's Joe Tisdall's car. 59.7 for Louis. So Archie is still in the in the lead. We'll pick up pretty soon the orange one, but in the meantime, here's Peter Howard in an immaculate Ulster. Number 14. I would call that Seville Orange. Yes, I think you could be right. Make nice marmalade out of it. Terrific, yes. Peter Howard, will he? 59-3-1, so Archie's still in the lead. Now, what can Joe Tisdall do? in the marmalade car. It's probably got its own Austin 7 nickname. There are some funny nicknames. Slippery Anne, the Penetrator. There are others as well. The Toy, of course, and Piglet. Joe Tisdall, rounding the final semicircle. It's in the 59s, it's in the 60s, 60.08. Behind him is John Adams, asked a replica, probably started life as an Austin 7 saloon, a, a ruby or something like that. Now with the Ulster body looking absolutely period and correct. Joe Tisdall has finished in the orange car with a 60.08. Don Adams hits for the finish in his replica and is followed by Graham Bennett. Beckett, I beg his pardon. Austin Sports 58.29 for Don, second on scratch so far. Handicap is very, very accurate, isn't it? Very it's, impressive. It's pretty good, isn't it? 
So Graham's handicap is 56 seconds. Now that's a bit of a challenge, but he might well do it. Yeah, but look at William yeah. Way down at the bottom, 49 points. I know. 56.52, well inside his handicap for Graham Beckett. Eleanor Tarling. Tarring follows in her Alster replica. 37 miles an hour through the bridge. Her first run time was a 69.87. I think she will just get under that. Let's watch the clock ticking away. Sixty-eight seventy-two. So a bit quicker than her first run. Meanwhile, Stuart Rose is entering the S's. Nice period number plate, hand painted, no doubt. Delightfully aggressive. Let's see how he tackles part, probably in the exactly the same way. Very nice, very skillful. Used a lot of work on the exit. Nice change up. Just sort of pop it down as he comes into road. You just hear the quick change, double the clutch. So number 18, Stuart Rose, time 75.7, but now William Way is going gangbusters in this little Oster. This should well be in the 50s, low 50s, I think. It will be. I think it'll be even quicker than Archie. It is 49.77. Wow. wow. For William. 49.5 is his handicap, so just a tickle above, wasn't it? Yep. Handicap is a cruel, aren't they? <laughs> they always have been. It's their job. Um, so he was the last runner in the class one brings us to louise craven here she is leading away class two so william way looks as if he's fastest in that uh, that class 49.77 subject of course to verification and protests there'll be lots of protests <laughs> sorry i don't do protests we don't listen to them. Louise has finished with the 61.89. Which is just outside her handicap. I said we had finished with Austin Sims, but we haven't. Here's Charles Ping. And I think there are more double driven ones as well to come later on. Ping is supercharged. That's why he pops in, I'm presuming. In the, in oh, class yeah, that's two. why we're in class two. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We've run out of jokes about him being pinged, haven't we? Um, yes. <laughs> we can come up with more if you like. <laughs> In the meantime, here's the Vale Special again. Company run by an aristocrat. Door opens, but he manages, he's struggling to fix it shut. I had an MGTC. Going round right hand corners, the passenger door used to fly open, which lost me a number of girlfriends. I should have tied them in. Well, I, fi I fixed a carriage belt in the air. So you couldn't escape. Is that why you managed to celebrate 50 years of marriage? Something like that. 59.38 for William Lowe in the Vale Special. Uh, a couple of seconds outside the handicap. Duncan Cartwright's Riley Ulster Imp going well. Number 28. I presume all the Ulsters and the Rileys, or the Rileys and the Ulsters, they separately drove them over, or would they have put them on lorries and whisked them across from the factory? I don't, I suppose they drove them onto the ferry. No, I'm uh, sure they did. Uh, yes, um, I, I think that. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what they did. And they, of course, in the ferries in those days, they actually had to be craned on into the hold. Yeah, of course. Because there was no railroad. Um, certainly for Le Mans in '34, they drove them down from the factory in, uh, to, to Le Mans and uh, presumably back again. And Jagger did with all their C types and D types. 
What fun! Do you think that was even as great fun as actually driving in the hall to get there and back? Absolutely. Dining on the way down, what fun! Like that. Well, I don't think they were on expenses. The mechanics drove it, driving them. I think they probably were lucky to have a, a croissant on halfway down. Or even a bed to sleep in, if necessary. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Number 28, Duncan Cartwright. 5587 and Andrew Baker number 29 5625 so quickest so far in this class well Ian Standing did a 5216 on his first run we're looking at the car number 30 that has that has won the big prize the Scrutineers Prize. I'm, I'm thumbing through my. Car number 30 is Scott Hughes in the, uh, in the Brooklyn. Yeah, it is. I'm looking for the page in the program with the description of the of the trophy. But anyway, it's going to be presented to Scott Hughes for the best presented car in the opinion of the Scrutineers. And it's quick as well, because he climbed in a 52.33, which according to my computer is the quickest run in this class on scratch so far. Richard Ashford well on his way in the Alster, followed by the lovely Molary Midget of Duncan Potter. The prizes are given out on page 43 and it's a silver Conrad trophy which we presented during Sunday on the scrutineers. The idea of the trophy was put together by Sally Johnson who felt it appropriate that a good presentation of a competition car should be acknowledged. Absolutely right. Here's the Morley Midget celebrating the C-type uh, or development of the C-type Morley C-type Midget that uh, MG broke records with at Montlhéry outside Paris in France. Actually one of the criteria of winning that is have all extraneous items been removed that would comply with your TF of losing your girlfriend out of the passenger yeah, door. She it? was extraneous. Yeah exactly. Absolutely. Duncan Potter in the MG 54.3 Eight in standing has just finished with a 51.36. Now we've got Jane Arnold Foster in number 42, Fraser Nash, which is the Anzani Tourer with the one and a half litre Anzani side valve engine, but a very elegant body with a split V windscreen, which is quite rare for a Fraser Nash. Fraser Nash, of course, built at Isleworth in Middlesex, suburb of London. And they continued building cars until the late 50s, post-war ones, all with Bristol, Bristol engines, although there was one with, a, with a, an Austin engine. Jane heads for the finish. Her handicap is 63 seconds and she's achieved a 66.59. She won't trouble the prize givers. Here's Jack Bond going, chucking his Mark 9, Mark 4. It's a Riley Mark 9, Mark 4, which is a bit of a mouthful, but he's chucking healthily around the semicircle. And his time is a 60.45. That's number 720. Shared car, followed by Simon Coates is number 43, Fraser Nash. 11.9 horsepower. Well, I hope he's, I hope the engine's still producing the 0.9. Lovely polished aluminium body. And again, the Anzani engine. Count the, count the exhaust pipes, you get a clue as to the engine in the Fraser Nash. Here's the Vale Special again. That has a little Triumph engine, only 900 cc. And it was a brave venture by Viscount Exmouth, 
but uh, doomed to failure because, of course, it couldn't compete with the likes of the uh, the Rileys, the little Rileys, the MGs and the Austin 7s. He was the very first gentleman to have an electric um, finishing line in terms of time on one of the Coast's promenade, a bit like Bright, wasn't he? I think. Well, that's news to me. Somewhere near, right. somewhere near Exmouth, I guess. Absolutely correct. Raymond Knight in the uh, Vail, 56.59. Now we're following Daniel Hunter in the jump, the Ulster that I accused of being white, but it is custom. Either cream or custard. Delicious either way. Birds custard were the people, weren't they? Lady yeah. Bird had a yellow Rolls Royce. She used to live in Sutton Coalfield, Birmingham. Quite right. A very splendid piece of machinery. He's for that very good custard. 62.48. Rather sneered at by the, uh, the French, who call it creme anglaise, don't they? Uh, well, well, creme anglaise is nothing like custard, is it? No. <laughs> and, it, and it wouldn't be, would it? You mean custard is not nothing like creme anglaise? <laughs> well, they're, 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 they're both totally different, let's put it that way. And, and I, I think as all red-blooded Englishmen will, will prefer custard. I had a, fr a friend with a sailing boat called creme anglaise. I had a friend with a yacht called Sir Osis of the River. Sir Roses of the River, <laughs> yes. That was based in Dartmouth, wasn't it? I think it was at one, st one stage, yes. Uh, but the lady who I knew who owned it uh, kept it at Portsmouth. Was she a doctor? No. I, th I think her husband was. Um, Sir Roses of the River. Well, well it, she may have bought it from him, perhaps. Oh, could be. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. We had one called Sack El Bar, which was Hawk of the Sea. Very amazing. Uh, Ted Elwes has finished in the MGTA, and his time 68.22, number 44. Number 45, Craig McWilliam. Here he is in this Super Sports. Super Sporting a Meadows engine. And it's unusual because it's a 1927 car. And they didn't really fit the Meadows much before 1930. A transplant? No, uh, originally a Meadows, and unusually with the exhaust tucked inside. So you can't count the exhaust pipes. Sneaky. I know. He's a member of the Corley family, enthusiastic as always. This is Andy in number 46, again with the Meadows engine. Time for Craig McWilliam, number 45, 60.03. Andy has finished with the 5688, gives us a chance to admire Paul Tebbit's lovely Type 22 Bugatti. The long wheelbase version of the Brescia, with its 1500cc four cylinder engine, that doesn't have rotor bearings, that started with the Type 25. But isn't it an immaculate and a very pretty French? Do you think it was slightly more stable than its Brescia because that's slightly longer wheelbase? But probably a better tourer. Right. 5822. Paul will be pleased to be under the 62nd mark. Is Yushan in the Anzani part uh, Fresno Super Sports? She says has no power but a very skillful driver. Well, let's. Uh, we'll be the judge of that. Well, he. Squirts it round the first S in true Fraser Nash style with the tail hanging out. So we'll give him a prize for that attempt. He also owns the Arcala, which is a, a, a unique Fraser Nash with the Arcala B twin engine in a GM. Yushan finishes with the 5607. Here's Rachel Holdsworth in a supercharged MGPB. And a little bird told me that Rachel was a very skilled horse rider. Appropriate number plate, MG4516. PB was the predecessor to the TA. And this one dates from 1936. 57.28 for Rachel. Here's Stuart Richmond. 
missed a gear coming up to Pardon, which will slow his time and give him great disappointment. So he's really sort of backed off now. Yeah, he has. He's sorry, we, back right we off. We have a red flag at uh, at, uh, up at Orchard. A bit of a chain, that's why. Uh, is that what it is? Only four links, by the way, looking from here. Yep. So is it four links, gentlemen? Oh, no, he's going back for a few more. So does that mean that uh, Stuart is running on three chains? Could be. Probably. Certainly is now. Certainly yeah. is now. Oh, look, he's picking up more chains. Yes, no. Uh, I think, think this gentleman is being turned back. 69.3 for Paul Stewart. I think you're right. I think he's minus a gear. Looking up at Pardon, it looks like there's a little bit more of a chain up there, too. And a, yes, a long piece of chain. Oh, we've got the whole length now. Don't worry, we'll be able to return it to you. Uh, so, Emma Potter in the Morley Midget has been halted at Orchard. She will probably be turned round and able to coast back to the paddock and have a rerun. All that adrenaline exhausted. Yeah, but it's another practice start, isn't it? So. Yes, very true. It all helps. That, absolutely, yes. Um, a little bit of um, quiet information, Ian, um, for class two. We think Ian Standing in the Brooklands uh, was actually fastest with 51.36, but Scott Hughes um, was uh, quickest on, ha on handicap with 52.33. Against a handicap of uh, uh, 53.5, yes, yes, you're right. Yes. Subject to official verification of course and uh, subject to the Ferrari team not putting in a protest <laughs> indeed yes <laughs> and the vintage in that class of course is held by the great James Diffie in the Austin 7 Ulster way back in 1998 at 49.13 it's time that it got broken isn't it well, it'd be nice to have, we've got, we've got two Diffies, we've got Senior Diffie here today, and young son Diffie is certainly following in father's footsteps, so it would be rather fun to see, see him uh, challenge that in a couple of years' time and break it for his, uh, his brother. We have a Fraser Nash on the line. It's Matthew Parkin in the Super Sports with the Anzani engine. with elegant bodywork. Boat tail, I think it's described as, unlike the TT replica, which has a slab tag. He's on his way. What's his speed through the bridge speed trap? It is 44, it's a healthy 44. Very good approach, good approach to Pardon, just tucking in nicely, sashayed through using all the outer part of that bend. Quick stab of the brakes, quick change down, coming to Rolt, disappearing amongst the trees. Yeah, hang the, hangs the tail out nicely on the way to the S's. That number plate is still askew, but at least it's still attached. And Matthew rounds semi-circle and finishes with a good time of 56.42. Here's the Fraser Nash Tourer of Richard Marsh, again with the Anzani engine. I think uh, uh, GN made over a thousand cars. I don't know how many in total Fraser Nash made. 2,300. Many as that. Yeah, I think, well, that, I, wow. think I remember seeing a record of that. I might be wrong in that, but I, that, that rings a bell. I've got Jenks's book. Priceless. I shall read, read it up. You bet. Again. So Richard Marsh heads for the finish and records a time of 64.33 in <laughs> number 52. Followed by this lovely Riley Sprite, such an elegant bodywork. Such, such a finish to its tail, I was thinking. It's lovely, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it? Really pretty. There are yeah. only a couple that we see in the, in the club. It's not easy to get that right in a vintage car. He finishes with a 55.71. He's followed by a rapid Riley Brooklands of Alan Clear, sharing number 29, which was driven 
by Andrew Baker. It's certainly an honourable class to win, isn't it, when you have 20, 30 odd cars in it. Very sporting winner on this one. At the moment, I think they're all trying to beat the Blakeney Edwards, aren't they, of course, who are coming in 68 and 70. Tony Wood might put a, or might put a, a feather amongst that. Yeah, Alan Clear, his first run was a 61.15. This is going to be quicker. It's a 60.03. He'll be pleased, although he would wish to have been under 60 seconds. Here's Bill Roston in Annie. Little GN. But quite a late GN with a, quite a touring body and I think the four-cylinder Anzani engine rather than the usual GN V-twin sticking out the front. Alan Clear's time, 60.03, I think we knew that. Bill Roston is there with the 57.33. And he's followed by the Lee Francis, which is struggling a bit. Not sure why. In fact, it might even struggle to a halt. That's a shame for Tom, Tom Reynolds. I've lost it in the trees. No, it's still moving. Yeah, it's Lang I think the word would be languidly. I think there'll be a red flag because you wouldn't want uh, wouldn't want Hamish Munro to attack him. Well, they from haven't behind. done it yet. I think the red flag's coming out now via park. It should be. It should be. It should be red flag. No, this could be interesting. Yes, because Hamish is still hammering on, and now he gets a red flag because poor old Tom is creeping out of the S's. At least I think he'll make his way to the finish and be able to return down the hill. But that's a pity. Nice car, the Lee Francis Tour. He's just about to emerge in front of us and the Marshall's hut. I think the word, yes, he's moving gently, 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 looking very seriously over his right side of the car. Now the dilemma is what Hamish would do. I suspect the Marshalls will send him slowly up to the top down the return road for a rerun. Tom is looking from side to side, wondering what on earth has gone wrong. And he's recording. We didn't, didn't clip anything coming from, from no, us. No, but he's, he's got a time. He's recorded a time of 170.04, which probably earns today's wooden spoon. And I have a horrible feeling he's stopped to be on the start, which means there's going to have to be a bit of pushing. Yep. In fact, old Tom is going to have to try and push it himself, I'm afraid, which may not work. My, my doctor has, has prohibited me from pushing. Absolutely. And pulling as well, I suspect. Well, I think so, don't you? I think, I think our marshals are looking for more equipment on the right-hand side as you come into Pardon. Maybe that's where his problem came from. You mean ran over a bit of C-H-A-I-N? No, our marshals are very, very, very efficient. Our marshals have eyes like eagles just see the steam coming from the railway it's puffing its way from west to east should be passing the lower part of Prescott in about three minutes uh, Emma Potter is where's she she's on the start line having a rerun do you remember she was red flagged yeah Maybe it, it was a puncture he got. On the side of the little MG, it says Team MG Intermark Race Champions 2017. That was rather good. Was that the team? They used to have team racing, didn't they? At I Bolton think so. Park and mm. Silverstone, which is rather fun. Four cars per mark. We had 18 to 20 of them. That was tremendous. And our running. Uh, they used to run in uh, appropriate sequences, and it was a team. The MGs were exceedingly successful. 
that must have been rather like the six hour relay race things like that or did they all race together and then ah i okay. don't know mm. i don't know a bit like the velodrome they didn't all stream out they went out in team in, in teams of one from the team of four i think from, uh, i think commentating was difficult because you had to use the computer very similar to the velodrome watching the extraordinary 100 laps for the boys and girls the last couple of days they did well didn't they oh it's amazing the danes i thought the danes were a bit naughty they looked as if they rode straight into our girl the australian when there he caused uh, that was, was it she or he i can't remember which one came batting through and occasionally you could see a bit of elbow jostling a bit like the grand national and and ascot racing they sort of pushed pushed with their elbows and sp speed skating as well they do that hamish in the nash is still patiently waiting on the way into the s's and I guess they're busy pushing Tom's Lee Francis up to the return road. <coughs> of course, it's the very last day, is it not, for our Olympics? We've done well. They were discussing on the track events whether the track with the, some of the records that have been achieved, international records and world records, whether the fabrication and the material used on the track was giving a slight advantage to the times being achieved. Yeah, they said it was a very springy, springy surface, didn't they? I suppose that would help you if you were a sprinter. Absolutely. Do you think that's an advantage that should be evaluated with regards to a handicap? Well, I think it should be uh, the the track should be passed by the inspectors as not giving an unfair advantage, and presumably the Olympic Committee do that. I don't suppose they do that in China or Russia, though, would they? <laughs> or on the they very do. controversial comment that I beg your well, no, I've I've stated what you, it. What are you suggesting? Um, it's C H E A T I N G. Is that a word in Russian? The other one is D E C E I T. <laughs> no, I think that's I think that's um, Hamish allowed to complete his run. Well, to a, a complete a run, but he'll get another one, of course, because he was flagged. Uh, quickest time that I can see in, on scratch in this class so far is number 33 in standing in the Riley Brooklands with a, a very quick time of 51.36. He was harshly handicapped with a 51.5, but he's beaten it. Chris, sorry, I think you're in you're in class two. I am, yeah. Sorry, am, we, yeah. Are, we are, are we not in class three? We are, but I'm just... I'm, oh, yes, yes, I'm, yes, yes. I'm, absolutely. I'm behind the times as always. Well, no, 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 not at all. I mean... Ian Standing has done has done well, um, but but he didn't beat his he he didn't <laughs> he didn't beat his ha he didn't do as well beating his handicap is what I'm trying to say. You two will be he, three rounds in the Olympics. <laughs> he didn't beat his handicap by enough. Thank you. That was what I was trying to say. And in class three, yes, uh, Jonathan Meller did a fifty. Oh no, we've got some forties. We've got a forty. Seven five got a forty five two one of course Patrick Blakeney Edwards but look at his handicap forty four yes so the the greatest under their handicap that I can see is Andy Corley two point one two under his handicap yeah I think that's right I leave it mm. to you to math you two mathematicians well I know it, it's actually been done by the magic of uh, computers and stuff. And oh, and come shows on, take, take praise, take praise. It's not often given well, to you. Well, thank you on. very much, yes. But, uh, um, I, I don't want to take praise if I'm not uh, actually do it. Okay, that's, that's with, withdrawn in that case. I'll take any, whether it's deserved <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay, yes. Well, I think this is the first time I have to say that I've seen uh, these these screens, which are uh, telling us not only the uh, 
the, the times, but the difference in, in handicap as well. So, uh, is that something to do with being to spec savers at long last? It's taken us long enough to persuade you. <laughs> now, listen, it's not a question that I can't see it. It's a question that I haven't been aware of it. You, <laughs> you, you guys have been enjoying cake and ice creams up here, you know, and uh, um, I have been toiling away in the shower cubicle. We obviously have considerably greater charm up here than you do in the shower tray. I never doubted it. Now then, enough of this banter. We've got a car about to set off. A sense of discipline. Nice to see the ice cream man doing more work there. Four very good ice creams going across with ooh, lovely chocolate sticks right at the top. Yum. What use is that information to somebody in New Zealand, Nick? Well, he would be <laughs> jealous because he's there talking to you at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and we're enjoying ice creams at mid-afternoon. No, so he'll be on the phone to the travel agent booking his ticket for next year. Well, we've asked him, in fact, you invited him. I did. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I'm not paying the airfare, though. No, I'll pay for his ice cream. Okay. Emma Potter's on the line in the Moneri Midget. Fires it up. Waiting for the green light, which she has got. And uh, off she goes. Rather a slow gear change from first to second, but uh, 32 miles an hour round bridge. I, I don't know how many more Leary midgets were built, only half a dozen or so, I think. They built lots of sea types on which the Moleri was based. Have you been to the revival? Which revival do you mean? At Monterey. No. No, no. I haven't. Yet. No. I must go. I've never been to Monterey. No, because it looks a fantastic fact that they originally purchased and built with all its intricacies. I think it looks a fabulous piece of track. Well, I tried to negotiate a commentary gig there, but uh, I was unsuccessful. Oh, we might have secured you one at Monaco, though, today. That would be good. Here's Emma finishing with the 65.74. Charles Pither took took off in the Fresno Alster with its twin cam version of the Anzani engine and it was stuttering a bit. It really had to clear its throat before it got going under the bridge. Going fine now. Touch of oversteer into the S's. Coming out of the S's. Neat and tidy, no problems. I don't know if this is a unique Fraser Nash body, but it's uh, you don't see many of them. Very swift approach. Pardon, very swift. Colin Pointer gets in wheel spin. So much power coming through Pardon. And chucks it into S's. In the meantime, Charles Pither in the red Fraser Nash 56.73. Remember, Simon Blakeney Edge was in this class on scratch with a 47, with uh, a 45-2-1. No, that was Simon. Patrick with a 45-2-1. That is the way to tackle Pardon in a Nash. First class, loved it. This is Granny. Yeah, ditto for the first S's. Mark's having a great time in Annie. Uh, things that should be better expressed, I think. So, Mark Ruston Edwards, 55.09, good time in the early GN. Here's Hamish Monroe having a rerun. Remember, he was red flagged. <coughs> Number 59. This is a Meadows powered. Razor Nash, but you don't see the three exhaust pipes sticking outside because they're tucked under the bonnet. 
So this is our first of our Boulogne's, isn't it, with uh, Mello. Jonathan Mello, yes, he's on his way in the Boulogne GT. Celebrating the Fraser Nash's success in the 1924 Boulogne races, Fraser Nash had the habit of naming their cars after previous uh, race successes. So post-war, we had Le Mans Replica, we had Mille Emilia, we had Targa Florio and Sebring. So why don't we have Fraser Nash Prescott? Well, because we've, we've mopped up all the names so far, we haven't got, we need, a, we need some new Fraser Nashes to give names to. A few years ago, there was talk of Fraser Nash being reincarnated and building supercars, but like so many of these things, it never came to anything. Jonathan Meller, number 61, time, 57.49. Dominic Hall is in the 40s, 49.14 in number 62 and that is the Fraser Nash Super Sports that was good certainly the approach of these latter Fraser Nash's is more lively with regards to their pirouetting through our two respective corners in front of us and the road that you can see on the screen David Johnson, that's a good time, 51-1-1. And this is John Clive Pigeon chucking, chucking it through the S's. It's a Boulogne, but in, with a TT replica body. He's followed by Jonathan Benning in a Fraser Nash Emerson. Mr. Emerson, Clive Emerson, used to build Fraser Nash's. He got the parts from Nash's and constructed them. I'm not sure if it was on his own type of chassis, but this is a very rare car, the Fraser Nash Emerson. Driven with vigour, I think is the expression. And Clive Fidgen has done a 49.05 in the Boulogne. You'll be pleased with that. In the meantime, Tony Wood, Super Sports. Time for Jonathan Fenning, 48-29. And what can Tony Wood do? He can do a 48-76. Just outside his handicap. Jude Roberts. Change from Fraser Nash's, we've got LM2, the second Aston Martin to race at Le Mans. With a one and a half litre engine, and Astons were always fairly robust cars. You'd think they'd have been too heavy for the little one and a half litre engine, but they were rugged and had great success. Having you've said which... You've just made a fatal comment. I've done commentator's curse because this one is going very slowly, but gives us a chance to admire this lovely ex-works Aston Martin. Put the think, red flag out. All right, so maybe, ah, uh, red flag for Simon, so that he doesn't bump into the back of the Aston. Do you remember seeing the Aston Martin? There were three of them at Silverstone, maybe three or four years ago and one had been found and it came back with the original mesh on the front windscreen so they put the mesh up in the evening so the, the mosquitoes and flies that you see at Le Mans or used to in the early evening were deadened by the little mesh and you could see see your way through and, and drive throughout the night. So Simon, um, Tudor won't want to know his time, something went wrong with the Aston Martin, which is a shame. If you've just joined us from uh, on screen, we've got the second oldest Aston Martin in the world still to come. That had a had a first run and stopped after pardon because it suffered fuel starvation. And Ian Chain, who's driving it, 
has been advised that the way to avoid that is to go into pardon even faster. So uh, that'll be something to watch with great interest. Uh, Patrick Blakeney Edwards is held on the start line and Patrick is by some margin the fastest runner in this class with a 45, let me just see, 45-2-1. Thank you, 45-2-1. Which is 1.21 in, inside, uh, outside his handicap. He's been rather harshly handicapped. So he'll be gritting his teeth and determined to go even quicker. It's always a display worth watching with this man behind the wheel. Yes, do you remember him racing the Owlet, which is the little Fresno saloon, incredibly quickly at Goodwood? So excited because something like that had been, I use the word carefully, ostracized from our racetracks until suddenly he arrived with it Let's see what Patrick's speed is under bridge. Good start, 2.94 seconds. 63, that's very quick run bridge. Breaking hard and then chucking it right at Orchard, chucking it left at Park. Almost perfect lines, weren't they? Yeah, and hardly hanging the tail out at all. Let's see how he tackles the S's. It'll be. No, I don't want to put the contest If I say it'll be brilliant, it won't be. But it is. E excellently handled. The Patrick round S's. Can he beat his previous 45 2 1? I think he blip, blip, can. Blip, blip. Yeah, 44 2 7. Still outside his handicap, which is a bit unfair, but it's a terrific time. And it would probably, subject to the usual caveats, take class on scratch but not on handicap no here's the front wheel drive alvis supercharged 1500 cc in the hands of mark haywood it took them years to sort out alvis to sort out this car it nearly cost them the, the whole company because it cost a fortune and very quickly they decided that it wasn't worth continuing and after making a few front wheel drive cars they went back to proper Alvises. Chris, we think uh, Patrick Blakeney Edwards has beaten the uh, record uh, for this class, uh, which he held before at 44.29, and he's done 44.27. You're right. Sub subject to the uh, usual caveats. Yeah. No, that's really good. Right, where are we? We're with Anthony Norton in the 1250 Alvis, heading for the finish, to be followed by Peter Johnson in the Super Sports Fraser Ash, sharing the car. The Alvis is finished with the 5806, 763. But historically, we had two cars here which we haven't seen for a while, which is one of the Jeremy Brewster Lee Francis Hyper, which picked up the record in 2010, and Adam Painter Maserati, the 4CS, I haven't seen a Maserati here for years, that was 46.42 in 2000 again. Good run by Peter Johnson, 56.33, here's the BMW Saloon, BMW 319 Saloon, little four-cylinder engine, Astonishingly quick. What year does this come from? 84? 1935, yeah, the mid-30s. That terrible time for Germany, but they produced some beautiful cars. Well, a certain gentleman who was actually restoring most of their... Um 
engineering and their economy, wasn't it? 34, 35 onwards. Richard Gatton's time, 56.64. Yeah, BMW really majored in motorbikes for a long time. And then out came the 328, which was sensational. And the 327, which was a very elegant uh, touring car, coupe, which really was the model for the post-war Bristol 400. Simon, Blakeney Edwards, time. 46.93 for number 68, which is quicker than his first run and seven hundredths inside his handicap. Rounding Pardon and into S's comes Ian Bingham in the TT replica Nash. This was the one with the Blackburn engine, six-cylinder engine, first owned by Tony Rippon when he was 17. Then Mike uh, Bowler had it, and not many were, predict were made with the Blackburn engine. Michael subsequently sold that car back to BMW after a number of years. That was the Mille Emilia car. Correct. Yes, he, which which post-war was had a Fresnash grill and everybody thought it was a Fresnash but Michael realized that it was a, 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 one of the team cars from the pre-war Mille Media and as you say I think he did a deal with BMW to give it back to them in exchange for a new BMW every year something like that. Well done. We had a note from Michael the other day he sent back a couple of programs that he'd obviously had here many years ago so I popped him a note and thanked him and referenced when we'd met way back at Bolzano. Richard Hulgate in the Louis Lee Francis 5578 here's Richard Wiseman now this is the Delage with its extraordinary engine which is an American version of the de Havilland Gypsy engine that never worked properly and he says it's been a complete nightmare trying to make it work up the right way up or rather upside down at least it's got an elegant body are you talking about the driver or the car? <laughs> the car I could call him an elegant driver, but the car is more elegant than the driver. And I've made a mistake. I'm, I'm describing the wrong engine anyway. I'll come back to the car that does have the American Gypsy engine. Ian Warner in the pretty three-litre Bentley two-seater is uh, nearing the finish to be followed by Tigress and the lovely Zagato Alpha. But in the meantime, we're focusing the cameras on Tigris Mark Three. MG eighteen eighty was their big touring car at a time when they were building M type midgets and then the uh, J two midgets. And some of these big six cylinder eighteen eighties were Made of sports cars and named Tigress. But I presume very few. I think half a dozen or so. Now then, uh, time for the Tigress 6784. Look at this lovely Zagato bodied Alfa Romeo 750 supercharged in the hands of Graham Scott. This one has always been in this country. But it reminds us that pre war. Italian supercars tended always to be right-hand drive. Because? Something to do with driving them over mountain passes, but I can't remember the detail of why it was. But he finishes with a 64.8. Followed by the Alvis Silver Eagle, number 94, of Dick Wilkinson, which is being hustled 
through the S's. Great. Brio. I'm chuckling. My, my logic is confused. Coming down a mountain, I could understand right hand drive. But going up, I'd be, I'd be a bit lost. Maybe? We'll look it up for you. I, I, yes, I don't know either. Um, um, but I do believe that it took the Europeans a long time to change from right to left hand drive. I think it did. The Swedes didn't change from driving on the left to driving on the right until the early 60s, I think. They had a, I think that's right, yes. They had yes. A, a weekend when, <laughs> when they changed over. Yes. Alex, well. Alex Pilkington has finished with a 55.69. My first visit to Switzerland on business, I was dealing with a fairly humorless Swiss gentleman. He said, why don't you British drive on the right-hand side? Why do you drive on the left? So crazy, you Brits. And I said, well, we've got plans to um, change to driving on the right-hand side, and we're going to do it in two phases. First the trucks, and then the cars. He said, ach, yeah, good idea. Good answer. Paul Wignall, Silver Eagle, 52.26 is a good time for that car. Alison Littlewood follows in the classic Van der Plas bodied 3 litre Bentley. Looking absolutely right, ready for Le Mans 1925 or so. Perfect engine note going through the top, coming up to Rort. Lovely Rort in Rort. I love that sweeping, very, very skimpy front mud guard. Didn't guard you from much of the mud, but it looked nice. Paul Wignall has finished with a 52.26 in car number 98. That is the Alvis Silver Eagle. Bentley is followed by its great competitor in the 60s, in the tw 20s, what am I talking about? The famous Vauxhall 3098, of which we have a great many examples here this weekend. Great to see. They celebrate the start of the weekend with a with a dinner in the clubhouse, which I think we had 43, 45 of them, plus their respective partners, so 80, 80, 90 of the, of the family, which was great. Brilliant. I hope they enjoyed it. I'm sure they did. I checked and they thoroughly enjoyed it. The food was good, the wine was good, and the company was excellent. Alistair Littlewood, Bentley 3 litre, his time was a 59.07. Ian Cheese did a 68.36. And we're currently looking at Saul Stevens in another immaculate 3098. I like them immaculate, but I also like them with real patina, real patina, which one or two occasionally you see are. Oh, they've never been, been restored. Here's an unusual hill climb car. This is the Ford Model A, the Tudor body, Tudor two door. They had a four door version, which was called the four door. Genius. At arriving at subtle names for their cars. Referencing your comment in Vauxhall with uh, Bettina on it, when Rob Hubbard finished his two years ago, the Vauxhall H Hypertype the Hyper Type 3098, he came up to the Lakelands and stunningly and winningly won it, which was great. So his first time out in a trial, romped home and there was great applause from all of those who'd been uh, exhibiting their cars and uh, giving him the success of winning. The Ford Tudor 5899. Annabelle Jones is nearing the finish in number 104, Vauxhall 3098. And does so with a 5885, followed by another one in the hands of Roger Thorpe. This is a 1924 model, so it's got front wheel brakes. When they were converted to four wheel brakes, I don't know whether they removed the transmission brake. 
Another question for the experts. But if you had a two-wheel brake version, you could go back to Vauxhall and they would fit. They would replace the front axle with one containing four-wheel brakes. Did you tend to return it after you'd had a bump? <laughs> Probably. But this one, in the hands of Charles Leith, has the Wenzel bodies. Asian. Skimpy rear seats was effectively a two-seater, named after the River Wensum. Does that flow through Luton? Flows into the Thames, and they're cleaning it up, aren't they, at the moment? Really? Same as the one in Stroud, when you talked about the rolled corner. There was a rolled uh, the canal coming through Stroud has just received 12.5 million pounds were to link it up from what it was in terms of its block blocked capacity. Excellent. Here's the Tigers again, being shared. We saw Geoffrey Radford in it. This is Andrew in the Tigris. Charles Leith, number 106, time 61.61. That was the Vauxhall 398. One interloper you and I have here is this glorious Invicta. Meanwhile, yes, that's a treat for the eyes. This is the one of the last five VX um, 3098s built, which had hydraulic big brake drums on the front. And Andrew, who owns this car, said this is the only 3098 that really stops. I think you have to be careful. If you stand on the brakes too hard, you get front axle trap, which is quite dangerous and can break springs and things. A little bit like that Irish dancing that they had on the stage. What was that called? You know? clog, clog dancing. Yeah, clog dancing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he records the 60.43. David Marsh follows in. Uh, 1398 dating from 1925 and I've got a treat in front of me on the start line that's the Invicta we'll see in a couple of ticks Marsh steadily up Prescott on the 1398 please do keep your comments coming we're not getting as many comments as usual but uh, we welcome them here's the Invicta classic Low chassis in Victor with the four and a half litre Meadows engine, just like the Lagonda of the period had. Built in Surrey. Surely we can't be competing with the uh, Olympics with Prescott. I mean, there's no comparison, is there? Well, it depends if you're a person of taste and discernment or not. In that case, you come and listen to Prescott. Exactly. But isn't this lovely? The Victor with the rivets all the way down the bonnet. Such an elegant car. There was one recently for sale, wasn't I think, in motorsport. I think it was just under five hundred thousand pounds. In this colour actually. The prices are getting ridiculous. I've got a copy of Motorsport from 1950 on the don't, don't, back don't. is the first Bugatti Royale, six hundred and seventy-five pounds. Why didn't our parents give us more pocket money at school? Except, of course, in those days, you couldn't buy tyres for it, you couldn't afford the petrol for it, you couldn't store it anywhere. It probably would have been a nightmare. Yeah, but you and I have been speculating as schoolboys, and we've done that all our lives. I know. Philip Milne Taylor, number 109, 5437 in the Invicta. So it's quick as well as being pretty. Dobbin. Vauxhall 39 OE from 1924. OE presumably means to old Ilian, is it? I don't know. I was trying to work out what OE means. Overhead. Overhead. Original engine. I don't know. We can't be experts on everything. 
Not amongst the three of us even now. <laughs> Phil Dobbin, 111. Oh, overhead exhaust. Yeah, it could be an overhead exhaust valve. Possibly. 61.95 time for Phil Dobbin. Charles Milne Atkinson is nearly at the finish and is followed by Jamie Quartermain in the Vauxhall Velox. I presume Alexander Deuce didn't arrive with the Delahaye 135M, which is a lovely car. So Jamie Quartermain is heading for the finish. Neil Thorpe in this makes a change from Vauxhall 398s, the Hudson Spike in special with its straight eight Hudson engine, side valve engine. Jamie quarter main time 56.7. Here's the Spikings Hudson special. Followed by John Guyot and the Talbot logo. Here he is. Oh, went, a, went up in flames, you remember a couple of years ago no. on the long course, just no. coming up to no. uh, the Tories. Quickly put out. Very quickly, very efficiently, Good. repaired and came back for his second run in the afternoon. Oh, really? Yep. It's a real work, a labour of love and a work of art on the, on the part of John to recreate classic Le Mans type Talbot. He gave me the once over yesterday on my little Delage. Did which, it? Was, which was important because somebody of a critical eye like that is of great value. Did he get the seal of approval? Only one little change, and those are the two fuel caps. He said those you should be French, not English, Nick. So we'll organise that for you. But he's in the 40s with a 4987 in the Talbo. Here's another Wensom body. 3098, such an elegant body. Not very practical, but who cares? And to the line comes the first of our Edwardians. We'll see in a second or two. But in the meantime, I will ask our scribe to give us who the winner is in that particular class. Presumably, I am presuming someone within the Vauxhalls. Uh, um, Tim Jones, <coughs> number one one eight fifty six three eight. Now here's Piers Trevelyan in this absolutely perfect restoration of an early 1998. Two-wheel brakes, absolutely everything just right and exactly as the original should have been. No wonder he's had many awards for this car. In the meantime, here comes the Brasier. Could shorten it to Bra, but that wouldn't be right. Race it just about. depends what size you're talking about, I suppose, really, in terms of the car. It's described as being a 1906 car. I think it's a 1906 chassis, body based on the 1904 Gordon Bennett entries by Brasier. Five point three litre engine. I don't think it's no it's it's an original Edwardian engine. It hasn't been re-engined with a, a Curtis aircraft engine or anything like that. It's great to see. Um, he's followed by James Roberts in the very early 1398 from the middle of the First World War. At a time when Vauxhall were producing luxurious staff cars for the generals and people like that. Made and uh, sold to the ministry many, many hundreds of them. That must have been the most amazing income cash for them during the second, yeah. uh, First World War. Keep the factory going. Oh, Trillion. tremendous. Vauxhall is followed by Clive Press in the three litre Sunbeam from 1912. Is that a Wolverhampton company? Sunbeam? Yeah, Sunbeam was, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Built the, a number of record breakers, didn't they? 
you and I had one of the record breakers two or three years ago brought back by two young Frenchmen, do you remember? Or was that at Shelsley? One of the two. I... Yes, you do. You yeah, do remember, I, yeah, I, I, know. I, I remember it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is the Dodge. <coughs> on, well, on the screen, we've got the, the Sunbeam Coupe de l'Auto, 3 liter class, and yes, you're right, behind him is the Dodge of Ron Burkett. Ex-Colonel Hornstead, oh. with that wonderful nickname. Mr. Cupid. He was the importer in the UK for Dodge, the American maker, and he had a great Brooklyn's history of driving extraordinary cars, including an enormous pre-First World War Benz, which you will see every now and then at uh, Goodwood Members meeting. Ron Burkett, 58.67 on the line, the first of our two Hudson Super 6 Specials of the type that Hudson raced at Indianapolis. So one presumes he survived the First World War, came back and set up the Dodge yeah. in the UK as a result of the the USA providing certain equipment I guess during so. the First World War. I think that must be right. Oh, interesting. Double driver in the 3098. This is Noel Ronalds Moss sharing with him. Jamie Quartermain. Here's the Hudson. Well, wouldn't it be terrifying to be the, the, the mechanic passenger on, a, on one of the American board racetracks? Well, apparently they had to be underage. They had to be between 14 and 15 and a half years really? old. Yeah. Which is quite, I mean, can, I mean, imagine they were given a couple of dollars for the afternoon racing. You know, and then you're back home to have tea before you go to school the following morning. If you crashed it and fell out, you'd get terrible splinters. Did you remember the board racing on the motorbikes? They just used yeah. to wear pullovers. Yes, I, I, I was going to say, I, I thought that there were splinters flying about anyway, <laughs> if you crashed or not. So um, it was pretty hazardous, I guess. There was a shot of the boys actually when the board broke, they could stick their heads up underneath the boards and watch the cars and the motorbikes coming towards them. Right. What fun! <laughs> Uh, the Hudson's done a time of 50.44, number 128, 129 is just heading for the finish. That's David Jones in the beautifully prepared Talbot. Prepared by the Paulson family and the elephant grey elegant colour. That's lovely, and here's Roger Twelve Trees in an equally lovely Wolsey 1630 racer, proper Edwardian racer supposed to be the first 100 miles in an hour at Brooklyn's, but failed, so it was conceptually called Never Was Famous. Just looks perfect, perfect example of the morning racer. See it pounding, bouncing around Brooklyn's. In front, behind him, is coming Hickey Hickling in the 1903 Gordon Bennett Pope Toledo which we will pick up. Hickey, 33 miles an hour through bridge, rounding hard. This car bearing all the scars of age. As indeed is the driver. <laughs> you said it. He wouldn't mind, he'd grin. No, he would. But isn't it fabulous to see a night? 18-year-old racing car, slightly off limits. <laughs> They're only both the same age, actually. Car and driver. Yeah, could Correct. Be. Yeah, could well be. There, there ought to be a prize for that, doesn't there? We're missing. Here it is. Robert Frankham is on the screen in the another lovely Corbett. 25.50, four and a half litre Talbot from 1913. And he's followed by Ian Barnforth, who races and hill climbs this Hudson Super 6 racer, another one of the indie type Hudson race cars from 
1917. Are we missing the Collings car though, the Mercedes? We haven't seen it yet, nor have we seen Ben Collings in number 15, the Duncan Pitaway's Bugatti Type 35, so maybe Correct. they've been rescheduled. The uh, Merck is just coming to the line, Roger Collings at the wheel. Meanwhile, Ian Barnforth, 57.23 for number 134, the Hudson Super 6, followed by the SCAT, SCAT racer of Andrew Howard Davis. He also races this car in Edwardian Racing at Goodwood and elsewhere. Will probably be at Mallory Park in a fortnight's time where the British Sports Car Club have their race meeting, including an Edwardian race. And this SCAT is a rapid, a rapid car. Sister car of one that won the Targa Florio before the First World War. Roger Collings, this is the oldest, we just see the scout finishing with a 5608. Roger on board the Mercedes, combined age, car and drive of 201 years. And Roger, with great skill, patriarch of the Vintage Sports Car Club, waving a salute to the marshals at the exit of Pardon. And we said it before, but Archie, who's 16, he drove this car at good adjustment speed two weeks or so ago. And Roger has been competing in this car since goodness knows when. Finish in the 50s. Nice 58.69. Julian Gauche in another very early 30.98. This is a pre First World War car. He started making 30.98 in, I think, 1913. And this is a 1913 car just after they made the Prince Henry box hall, of which we will shortly see an example. Julian, 53.57, good time in the 30.98. Here's Matthew Burkett showing the horns to Dodge. And on the line we've got the 5-litre Bugatti, chain drive Bugatti. Brother of Black Bess. Driven by Edward Williams, but uh, on screen we'll watch the Hornstead Dodge. Probably his sister, actually, rather than brother. Christopher. You think so? Yeah. Young Matthew Selesky drove, I'm not sure if it was this car, but it was a T60 just like this in the members' meeting at uh, the last Goodwood time, 2019. Had a fairly lurid spin at St Mary's, just missed bending the tail on the bank and recovered to fight another day, which he did. So much acceleration. Yeah. Very impressive. As you say, wheels been coming up to the semicircle, just past the, yeah, Marshall. You can just see the little wisp of rubber on tarmac. Wonderful. So he's finished with a 56.14. He's followed by Jeremy Flan in the Curtis powered Le Zebra, little Le Zebra French chassis with the big um, 8.2 litre Curtis Ox 5 aircraft engine, V8 pushrod aircraft engine, very light. End of the First World War, there were lots of these left over. You could pick them up original in their packing cases for 25 bucks, and lots of people did. Put them in boats and things like that. He's done a 49.13 in the Le Zebra. Excellent. Here's the Walsley again. Understeer, oh dear. Understeer and then into the Armco. Uh, so there will be a red flag. Glad to say I think William is fine, but unfortunately the car isn't.
Was that the moment of changing gear just before the bridge? No, I think he got terminal understeer around the Tom Rope corner and then it really took charge. Right. So we'll have a bit of a pause while the Walsley is recovered. Hope the front of the chassis isn't bent. I suspect it might well be. So, terminal understeer and unfortunately couldn't train it up in time. But driver perfectly okay, just cross with himself and suffering a pain in the wallet. Nathan Tasker from Australia, late night here in Australia, loving the commentary and the cars on track. Thank you, Nathan, and we empathize with you in Australia. I hope you're not suffering yet another lockdown. It'll be all over one of these days. JJW Master Fitter watching from Midland Rescue Unit at Lowton Park. You should be concentrating on the hill climbing at Lowton Park. It's a, I don't think it's a championship meeting there, it's a uh, clubby meeting, but Lowton is a lovely hill. Almost up at Langochlan in Wales. Who holds the fastest lap time at Vintage Prescott? Well, it's a hill rather than a lap tinker, but the record for the short course is held by James Baxter driving ERA R4A with a time of 39 point. Let me just have a look and see if I can find it. 39.68. That's for the short course. Uh, the long course record, I'm not sure who holds that. I think you and I'll find it's James yet again. N he, he, and T he and Top is certainly between the two of them. Mike, Mac might have had it earlier, on, but I think Baxter broke it in R4D subsequently when Mac lent it to him. A nice message from N1700BHCH, which is an unusual name, but watching in Australia, thank you. Loving the onboards and replays while you lunch. Yeah, that was fun. We don't often do that, but it certainly fills in the time nicely, doesn't it? Very good idea. Excellent. There is a plan to put those interviews on um, the Vintage Sports Car Club's website, so I hope that works. Chip Wright, watching from Laguna Seca and the Monterey, Monterey Prehistorics. That's a wonderful circuit, remember, with the corkscrew down. So thanks, Chip. I hope you're enjoying that. I was asked over lunchtime, a couple of the people said, what did, what did the race drivers actually wear pre-1939? So I dug out a couple of, it's called dress code. Nuvolari inevitably wore a yellow jersey. Chiron, a blue knitted helmet. Echelon, a Czech cap worn back to front. Well, I've seen a couple of those today in the paddock. Birkin apparently just wore a blue hank, a neckchief round his, uh, his collar. Trossi, a colonial racing helmet. That must have been an early idea for safeguarding. And all those photographs are in the Peter Hull's book, A History of Brooklyn's Dieppe and uh, the Mili Miglia. Well, Tim Birkin was racing in North Africa wearing a short sleeved shirt and burnt his arm on the exhaust pipe getting out of the car, which went septic and killed him. Those were the days before antibiotics. But the night before he died, he was drinking champagne in the Savoy Hotel and having dinner. And the following morning, he unfortunately didn't get out of his bed because he was dead. Awful. Very, Awful. very sad. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've had a message from Indonesia, which is, uh, Rich, I think, can put back up on the screen, from Gusti Ramadana with a nice uh, comic picture watching from Indonesia good luck to all of the drivers thank you Gusti and you must come over from Indonesia one of these days I've only been there once to Jakarta 
the top of a skyscraper hotel there was an earthquake which uh, made it sway from side to side which uh, was interesting what do you think they've got tucked across there for cars that they might bring back to Prescott? I uh, might have some real... Ooh, gems! I know. Kima Customs, great commentary here in damp Sussex, watching this while building my Austin 7 special. Well, Kima, I hope it's finished for next year and you can come and compete in it. Damp Sussex, well, we're lucky so far to keep touching... Prescott is dry. Luca Bond, watching Luca from Cornwall. Bond. Fantastic stream, chaps. Thank you, Luca. That's very nice of you to say so. Um, watching by Pond. Great stream. Alex's vintage car. Well, good, thanks. Enjoying it, I'm sure. Um, if you've just switched on and wondering what's going on, we've had a slight whoopsie at uh, a car coming out of the S's which is going to be, have to be recovered by the Tonka toy because the front axle is quite severely bent. That's the Wolseley special of William 12 trees. So there'll be a lot of midnight oil being burnt in the garage straightening the Wolseley. I think the trust is open all afternoon too, is it not, Christopher? I think it is. It certainly it, was yesterday, yeah, you and I. There are lots of Bugattis parked outside it and uh, people coming in and out. So I hope it's open. It's well worth a visit. It's open. Is it open six days a week? I'm not sure. Uh, by appointment at the moment, but right. it, that, that is getting more open. So by appointment, I would suggest, is the, is, is the response to your question. Okay. On the line, we've got Stephen Hughes in the Riley 9. Yet another Riley. Rileys are so popular. They were so popular in the 20s and 30s. Then they got swallowed up by the dreaded British Motor Corporation. In the trust, they're doing the obviously the the Brescia Italian uh, celebrations of 100 years, and we're celebrating this here at se on September the 8th uh, at early because in Italy. In Brescia, they're linking up with us. I think it's 9:15 or 9:20 to celebrate on the 8th of September, 1921, the 100 years. That was the Grand Primo di Italia Monticelli, 20 laps, which is roughly 346 kilometres. Uh, the Bugatti Trust have inside a original of the medal award to the four cars that that were involved. Ernst Frederick was the winner. And he subsequently opened a Bugatti uh, agency in the south of France, in Nice. And he was followed by three other of his colleagues, Pierre de Vicenza and Michel... Looks like broccoli, but it can't be. Braccoli, I think, is the pronunciation of Italian. And Piero Marco. Was Ernst Friedrich a Frenchman? He, wa he was. No, he was French. French, really? Yeah. I never knew that. And oddly, uh, oddly enough, subsequently, the gentleman who joined him as a driver and salesman, he bought a 35, a 37 a Bugatti. Not Count Trossi, come on, please come on, please. And he subsequently teamed up with Chiron. And they both they bought a Type 35B when they went independent of of Bugatti, and then subsequently joined the Alfa Romeo team. I'm trying to think of his name. Became a restaurateur in America, in New York. When um, Raymond Mays had the br two brushes, Cordon Bleu and Cordon Rouge, the engines were developed by Amherst Villiers to rev to about seven and a half, eight thousand revs, and produce much more power than any Brescia before had done. And Ettore Bugatti invited Raymond to bring one of the Brescias to Molsheim so that they could have a close look at what he'd done to the engine. There's Pretty impressive times though, weren't he, Raymond Mays? Yeah, he was. He actually but raced one of those in 1923 at Shirt. Sheerness Sands, because sand racing at that time was really quite popular, wasn't it? It was. There's a famous photograph of Raymond driving one of the brushes at Cop Hill Climb when the 
rear wheel de detached itself and the and he looks at it just looks in the over his shoulder yes. Hoy, where are you off to and the Sheerness one there's a photograph of him on the brescia with one of your airplanes flying above it apparently the acceleration of the car was greater than the than the, the I, I presume a tiger moth no it wouldn't be tw 1923 would it what aircraft did you have then well it might have been a gypsy moth or something like that right or right. leopard moth right. i don't yeah i don't know so William Twelve Trees is going to get a lift back down to the paddock. The car is safely parked. Ono Kurnerman is having great fun watching the stream from Holland. And see you in two weeks' time to enjoy Mallory. Good. Um, I don't know if Mallory is being live streamed, but I, Ono, I hope you're coming in person. That would be terrific. If you do, come and say hello to the commentary box. Ian Lawson watching from Malta, really enjoying the racing and commentary. So many familiar names from the Riley and Walser Hornet Special Clubs. Hope to bring my Riley 12 for special one day in the future. Well, you must. Looks like a, mo a nice motorcycle as well. They've got some interesting vehicles um, on, on Malta. I, I was over there once to commentate uh, on the Malta Grand Prix. Uh, which ultimately didn't actually happen, but never mind. Uh, and they had a sort of concourse on the Sunday uh, where I discovered a truck uh, which was called a Rotten-Off, which was a tank transporter. Um, and, and of all the places to find one, Malta, Malta actually had one. We've had a nice message from France, which we'll just put up on the screen, uh, giving greetings to Class 13. Say hi to Class 13 competitors from the French Duna family, ex-Class 13 competitors. Vic Vincent, thank you for that. Presumably so many cars in Malta as it was a stop-off point for us British boys before they were well, it, hammered it, it, by it, the it, Germans. It, it was a very strategic point as well, of course. And it has uh, to be. I had a chum who, whose dad was in charge of the, uh, the port, as it were, and when he retired, he retired in Malta, he actually drove back home to the UK in a, a Morris Minor. There's a recent book about the convoy, the last convoy that tried to get, well, did get through to Malta with um, hurricanes on board and fuel and suffered terrible losses, including a tanker that was either torpedoed or bombed which they managed to strap to another ship and towed into Malta Harbour. Incredible, the effort they made and the number of ships and people they lost on the way. Yes, they, they had a bit of a, well, they had a, very much a hard time. They did. We're back in action, and we're back in action with Stephen Hughes on the line with the Riley 9. Car from 1930. Polished, well, fairly polished aluminium body. And there is a bit of a silencer, but it's got the Brooklyn silencer at the back, the fishtail. And it still makes a nice noise. I hope his next door neighbors are tolerant. Chris, we've moved, we've moved into Class 8, special sports cars. Okay, thanks. I shall adjust my computer appropriately. Does that mean we've missed out Jeff Smith? The Picard Piquet. We have. I, I think it only means we haven't seen him yet. Yeah. Yeah, I think there have been some, some changes in the running order. We haven't seen... Um, Ben Collins yet in the Bugatti. Stephen Hughes on his way in the Riley. Wilfred Corley, who put up a very quick time in the Little Austin 7 Special. You mean he smashed his handicap? <laughs> he did by 2.77 seconds. Here he comes. Waving the Corley family flag as extremely rapid drivers. He's, uh, 
He's hit a ferret or a stoat on the way here, which is embedded in the radiator grill. Can he load it? It'll be just over 50 seconds. It's a 50, 54 4 8. But it's quicker than his first run, which was a 55 2 3. So he's now three point, three and a half seconds inside his handicap. Could well be a class win on handicap. John Muir, Riley Brooklyn's replica. His first time was also within his handicap, which was a 56 3 3. The liquid stout, of course, is quite useful in a casserole. <laughs> stout or... Or stout. stout. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather have a stout I than agree. a stout. I was, playing, I was playing with the words. Here's John Galley with the Austin 7 with the Blackburn little tiny radial three-cylinder aircraft engine. Developed, I'm sure, pretty sure by Chris Williams. His daughter Rachel used to drive it at Chumley Place like that. In fact, took her, took her mother around the circuit on one occasion. And you and I <laughs> spotted it on the screen. We did. And we had a bit of naughtiness because the two of them were having a, quite an interesting discussion. And it was coming over the screen, not that they knew. And you and I were... <laughs> You're a very naughty girl. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um... John has finished in the Blackburn with a time of 58.06. John Ian Muir, number 157, recorded a 54.33. Alex Peacock, the Amalcar Riley. Interesting, really interesting combination. A narrow little Amalcar chassis with um, the classical Riley. 1048cc engine like the one in the Brooklyn's Riley. So it's a, it's a powerful combination and records 53.61. Here's Clive Bergman in the little yellow Austin 7 special. Almost Gallio Italian yellow, isn't it? It's lovely, bright, sharp, sparkly with the sun just about peeking through on it. Yeah, I never know why. The Italians call it giallo fly. Yellow fly. I, like I imagine there was some Italian fly with with wings that it that has caused the problem or caused the idea. It's funny, isn't it? And then uh, little open sports cars are called spiders. Clive Bergman finishes with the 56.99, followed by Alistair Bailey. Rounding part in his Rally 9 special. Another Rally 9 special of Kevin Morton follows on. And Kevin's is much the quicker under the bridge. Alistair did a 33 miles an hour. Kevin did a 46. And he kept the speed right the way through to part. And it would be a good little score for him on this one if he keeps that pace up. Alistair Bailey's first run was a 67.2. Kevin's was a 54.38. So, yeah, quite a difference. 65.91 this time for Alistair. Can Kevin beat his previous 54.44? No, slightly slower than before. Matthew Craven, Austin 7. Class 8 is for special sports cars, saloon cars. Up to 1100cc unsupercharged and up to 750 supercharged. So presumably these are lost in servants all are blown. Which is interesting that Geraint Owen holds the record in the vintage with a Morris Jap at 50.28 back in 1995. That was prior to the days of him coming up with the Type 35B and then the 
or the single seater that you and I see at, at, uh, at Goodwood. Well, he's got the um, the American IndyCar, hasn't he? The, I can't remember what it's called, the Dean Van Line Special. And also Babs, of course, get around drives as well. But he's also bringing a school of uh, engineers here shortly um, from Bristol University, where he's professor of engineering. On the screen is the Humber, with Jocelyn Jones on board, Humber 818-1928-1929. Just, just a bit of information, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, Wilfred Crawley um, significantly did better than his handicap. To the extent of uh, 3.52 seconds. Yep. At 54.48. So he's almost a shoe in for the class win on handicap. I would think so, yes. David Fennell finishes in with a toy in a 54.12, which is quicker than Wilfred. But I suspect he was handicapped more severely. Here's the Stoat again, this time being hounded by Sam Robbins. And, and we've got more, more gardening down here by the marshals at uh, Paddock. Sam Robbins in the same uh, car as Wilfred Corley uh, records a 57.91. Uh, yes. Orchard is getting a, a bit of a knock today, isn't it? It, it seems to be the uh, the grass, particularly on the inside of the corner. It'll be ideal for planting October bulbs. Yeah, you get, might get whacked around the face by a daffodil if you're not careful. Well, our first meeting is post-Easter, so we should be all right. I'm glad to hear it. Will we have a new commentary box? Fly Giallo is Ferrari Light Yellow. F L Y. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you, Jeffrey Fogel. It's redundant because Giallo is yellow in Italian. Uh, I kind of get that, but thanks for the message, Jeffrey Vogel. And gelato is of course, gelato, of course, is ice cream. Absolutely. Poor, I'm not sure if it's Ginnings or Ginnings in the. Lagonda Rapier with its twin overhead camshaft 1100cc engine. W.O. Bentley, when Bentley um, were bought by Rolls Royce, he joined Lagonda or was a consultant to Lagonda. Didn't design this engine but did design the V12 engine, the big V12 engine that Lagonda fitted in the late 30s. Very luxurious uh, saloon car engine. Talking about saloons, there are some beauties in the car park today, I must admit. Neither you or I or any of our team have been able to go across the car park, but certainly watching and one or two going in there was some very glam machines. There's some lovely machines in there. It's, you could almost spend all day in the car park. Well, you and I used to go and give the the best picnic party in there because some people stay in there the whole day in picnic. Oh, champagne on the champagne and smoked salmon on the running board. I noticed historically a few bottles of excellent claret. Good, doing things properly. Absolutely correct. As is St Tim Stamper on his riding book his replica. He's heading for the finish. He's followed by the BNC. Time for Tim, number 757, 56.72. Here's the BNC, number 181, manufactured by Monsieur Bolac and Monsieur Netter. Quite a... There's a story behind the N. Netter. There is also a slightly risque joke that I don't intend to t tell, I'm afraid. You tease you. Tell us later. So the finance was provided by Monsieur Bollack. So when Mr. Netter was asked 
about the money. He said it's all bollocks. I couldn't possibly have said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all bollocks. Um, 181, Rachel Blake, 59.63. That's in the BNC. One red card. <laughs> <laughs> Only one. I'm well, you I'm gave, you gave me you gave me three today already. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eleanor Bergman and Austin Seven Special going well. Um, Rachel Blake in the BNC fifty nine point six three, and following Eleanor is John Butler in the Little Riley Special. Eleanor finishes with a seventy two oh eight. Austin Seven. Off the line comes Joe Parker in the very white Riley special. White body, white wheels. I was going to say white complexion of the driver, but that wouldn't be fair. Time for Eleanor Bergman. 72.08. Time for John Buckler in the Riley. 57.51. And Joe Parker is on his way in the white Riley. Well, Raymond Mays had a special called the White Riley, didn't he? He did but indeed. We actually it? see it too, don't we? It's we do occasionally. Very yep. occasionally. But this isn't it. This is even whiter. Was it White Riley? And then there was something called the White Mouse. Was that the same? No, White Mouse table. Right. Was, uh, was that ERAs? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yes, of course it was. Right. ERAs. Yep. yep. That, that, that was uh, Shuler's. Shuler's. That's machine. right. Yes, yep. it was. Here's Joe Parker in the Riley Special going towards the finish, followed by Jonathan Bowyer in this very attractive Riley 12.4 Special. Nicely designed body. 1500cc engine, so it's a 12.4, it's not a, a Brooklands based on the Riley 9. Vintage held in this again by a Master James Baxter in the Fraser Nash Fast Tour way back in 1995 at 47.94. It's time these records got broken, isn't it? I agree. It has been tough, though. It has been very tough. I mean, the handicaps over the years have got stricter and stricter. And of course, with vintage cars, you can't bring out a new model each year to, to go even faster. Both car and driver get older. They do. One or, two, one or two drivers do tend to put on a bit of weight, I suggest, and I uh, wonder whether that might have some influence. I wonder who you're pointing your finger at. Well, I, well, I, was, I was speaking very generally, you know. I, 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 must, I mean, drivers through the winter will spend a lot of time lightening the car. But um, not lightening themselves. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, Love a, it. it's a thought, isn't it? Well, Sean Gould, who holds the record here in his incredible Gould TR59, when I saw him at the first meeting, he said, I've, I've taken, what did he say, I've taken 20 kilos out of the car. I said, how on earth did you do that? He said, by slimming. <laughs> Excellent. One, one pound is equal to one horsepower, is it not? Is it, I haven't seen that calculation, but yeah, I can believe it. So. Yeah, uh, Where are we? We are with Christopher Craven having finished. and We're now focusing the screen anyway on the Humber Winder of Kevin Jones sharing this car. Beautifully polished aluminium body, skimpy wings. You don't really associate Humber with sporty cars, but they did. There was a TT Humber, wasn't there? Yes, there was indeed. So he's nearing the finish. He's followed by David Saxel in this well used Riley 12 4 special. I do admire this car. It's not, it's not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Elegant. It, no, it's, it's elegant. It, it's not concourse, but it's utilitarian. Yes. It's very rough and ready, but it's lots of fun. Well, it, it obviously, I mean, he, he campaigns it with significant verve, so it obviously does things very well. Sufficient verve to get up the hill in 54.75. Michael New in a similar Riley 12.4, a different body. But, uh, it's elegant. Cam 
tail, the first, probably the first example of a cam tail. And he's actually put the number plate right on its bottom. He has, and he finishes with a good time of 55.27. David Morley really chucks his riding special through the S's. No dramas, but a bit of smoke and certainly not hanging about at all. What can this be? Can it be under the 50-second mark? It might. Not quite. 51.28. That's a great run by David Morley. Here's the Wolsey Airy special. We were commenting on the radiator grill that is a, a work of modern art. Fastest so far in that class at the moment goes to uh, Mr. Dave, Dr. David. Yeah, we've moved into class nine, haven't we? Special sports cars and saloon cars. 1500cc unsupercharged, 1100cc supercharged. So I must supercharge my computer and we'll get up to date with these guys. Well, his, his leading the field was only short lived, I'm afraid, because car number 191, Paul Compton, in the Wolsey Area Special. Is now fastest at the moment. In class, of course. Well, Greg will be looking at that score. He comes in at 194 with a Riley special. He'll be looking aggressively at that. What was his first time, Greg? Well, it, it, I was 47.52. It's very short, short lived because 192 has done 50.42. So he's fastest in class at the moment, I think. Colin Wilson have finishes with a 48.82. We've got Greg right. on the line. This should be, should be the class winner. I'm going to put my money Four. fairly and squarely on him. 47.52 first run was two seconds outside his handicap, so he's been fairly harshly treated by the handicappers. That's because he wears the loudest shirts of all. But this time it's a 47.87, so fractionally slower than before. Riley Special, William Buckler, into the S's. It's a shared car. Butler finishes with a 54.83. Roy Tubby in the BMW powered TT replica. I think I accused it of having four cylinders. Taking off the line, it sounded very six cylinder ish. Two litre car. We haven't got exhaust pipes to count. Classic TT replica body. And don't forget that all these Fraser Nashes have chain drive, no differential, which is why they tend to go around corners in a series of. Sashing. Yes. Roy Tubby finishes with a 56 2 7. Here's Ian Smith, Alvis 1270 special. You can buy replicas, recreations of the classic Alvis cars, particularly the four and a half litre, the just pre-war, very elegant. You talked to, I think, uh, Red Triangle Motors in Kenilworth. Correct. We invited them last year, but of course that didn't comply with anything, to come here with a couple of their replica cars and uh, introduce them to the to Prescott and and to our audience. On the screen, we've got Jane Tomlinson in her Alvis 1250 elegant car.
dates from 1928. Jane finishes in a second or so, followed by our glorious leader, Paul Tunnicliffe, in the AC-powered Fraser Nash Colmore. I don't know the significance of Colmore, whether there was a, a hill climb there. But anyway, Paul finishes with a 59 seconds exactly to be followed by Andrew Oliver in the one and a half meter ride special. He's safely navigating the S's. That's Andrew Oliver sharing this car, although he hasn't changed the number on the side, I don't think. It still says 189. But the computer says it's Andrew Oliver at the wheel, followed by William Irving. Alvis. And then we'll see Charlie McAvoy, who's just leaving the start now in the F Type MG Magna. Here's this blown Alvis 1250 of William Irving. Andrew Oliver in 789, 54.19. On the screen round orchard is Charlie McAvoy in the MG F type Magna. Very beautifully put together. It's lovely, isn't it? it? It's a lovely piece of machinery. It is, with a supercharged 1300cc engine. Did the Magna have six cylinders, little six cylinder engine? Yes, yes, it did. Yeah. Did it have a pre-selector? Was that has that been changed by that period? Nineteen? Where are we? Nineteen? So do you know? It might have a pre-selector. Could well it? have a pre-selector. Yeah. 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 And rounding pardon is Claire Fernand Williams in the toy. Charlie finishes with a 53.28 in the MG. Offline comes Barbara Lerigo. We'll catch her on the screen. Very shortly, meanwhile, Claire, nice line through. The S is not using all the road. Barbara takes the Riley Special up to Park. Claire is round a tourism, a round semicircle, and records a 60.33. The car another number 770. Is Barbara in the S's? Emerging through semicircle past the marshals and sprinting towards the finishing line. She did a 56.34, now it's a quicker time, 55.25, more than a second. Jane Corner on her way in. Super Sports Lagonda Rapier. That proves that macaroni lunch is the best thing to get in the fastest time of the day for your class. Oh, is that what uh, Barbara had? Yep, I saw her enjoying a very good macaroni lunch. Pasta is so healthy, isn't it? Absolutely correct. Ooh, that was a bit tight. Ooh, just got away with it. Was that Jeffrey? Ins uh, ins inside leg of park. Oh, really? Jane Corner in the Lagonda 55 9 9. Jeffrey Edwards is having a bit of a dramatic climb in this supercharged Alvis Silver Eagle. I think it must have cost him a little bit at Pardon. Do you agree, Nick? I do. And this is sponsored by Longstone Classic Tyres, so. We may need a couple of inside <laughs> left rear left tyres for that one. 53.55. Ian Woosencroft, 1270 Elvis Special. Finished with a very good time, 52.66. Followed by Trevor Corner. Mr. Corner, we've seen Mrs. just now, but Trevor's in this lovely Talbot 105. Three litre, 
3 litre Talbot was a very deceptive car. It was quite quiet, but my goodness, it was quick. Fifty-three point three eight. Ian Roach in the TT replica. That's the Shelsley front axle. Do you see? If we, if we see the front axle, the straight across front axle of the later Fraser Nashes is called the Shelsey axle with radius arms to control the front wheels better. Uh, no, we're not going to see him going around semicircle, but have a look in the paddock and you can see the difference between the front axles of the earlier and the later Nashes. Roy Newton heads towards the S's in the MG J2 with a Riley engine and I think a slightly extended chassis looks much longer bonnet than the standard J2. Ian Roach did a 54.54 in number 210. That was the BMW powered TT replica. And here is Paul Weston chucking his AC powered TT replica through the S's and round semi giving it the beans definitely and records a 51.88. You'd call that broad beans, wouldn't you? You would. Broad beans this year were delicious for my vegetable garden. Oh, a little <laughs> bit of butter and a tiny bit of salt. They were it? superb. Oh, yes. delicious. Uh, with Steve McAvoy, We've seen Dad in this car. This is son Steve. 1300 supercharged F type Magna. We think it's six cylinders. Often MGs had six tiny cylinders, and it's a 54 1. And I'm trying to get my computer to move, but it's gone and frozen. Ours is working, so we can help you. No, it's okay, it was finger trouble, I got it right. 214, we are in class 10. Jack Pepiat in <coughs> this very effective Walsley Hornet special. Dudley Sterry coming up a little bit behind this, who's normally one of the fastest in the HRS sports, and then you've got. Um, yeah, I would say and the, the, the AC GN Beetle was always a, a, a very competitive vehicle to thunder up Prescott. David Knight runs Harden. This Fraser Nash has the BMW six cylinder engine from the mid 30s. Went on to power the famous BMW 328. So in the little light. Fraser Nash, it's a very powerful combination. And exceedingly reliable, I would think, too. Exceedingly reliable. Yeah, 51.86 for David. On the line, the ACGN Beetle. This is the AC, and again, the AC six cylinder straight six engine in a GN chassis. 220 dating from 19 well it says 1922 which presumably means the chassis the GN chassis bound to be bound to be bound to be although the AC engine first this AC engine first appeared in in uh, 1919 but that was a very utility machine that came out in 1919 wasn't it in um, Kynan's Mews, or one of the London Mews, wasn't uh, it? Oh, was it? Yeah. And then they moved down to, um, where were AC? Sorry. Just outside Brooklyn, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. Andrew Frank, time, good time, 48.04, locking front wheel on the way into Orchard was Morris Gleason in the Riley Special, but no harm done. This burst of sunlight now, we've got the great majority of park in shadow.
remind you to be bathed in sunlight after that nasty dark grey cloud is a bonus. We've been very lucky indeed today. So Morris Gleason nearing the finish. Anthony Gallius Pratt has taken off in the four and a half litre, three litre Ben If you understand what I mean, Morris Gleason finishes with a good time of 52.98. Here's the Bentley. Which has the classic Vandal Plus aluminium four seater body. Very traditional Bentley shape. I think did ben, I think the Bentleys had a middle throttle pedal, didn't they? Centre pedal, which we have to get used to. I've only ever passengered a Bentley. I have been under Goodwood up on the hill. 60.91 for Anthony. Yeah, I've never driven a Bentley. Some of them have very difficult gearboxes that you have to really get the hang of. Lots of pauses, you mean? Yeah, well, the pauses have to be absolutely right, because if you leave, leave them too long, you have to start again. Kate Burke in the TT replica Nash at Pardon and uh, Rebecca Smith 235 in the Little Morris Minor has gone up in a rapid time of 50.4. That's really good. Here's Kate Burke. Absolutely classic TT replica Nash, but with an unusual engine. Here's Craig Collins in the Delage with this strange American built gypsy engine that uh, I think was built under license in the States but was a, an abject failure. And um, Collings family put this engine, turned it upside down, put it in this delage, and um, it's almost made their hair go grey ever since. But it, so it makes it a great relaxed touring car. I should think it eats up the miles. And, the, and uh, passes everywhere on the road except a gas station. <laughs> Craig Collings, 52.38. Here's Nicola Quartermain in the Vauxhall 3098 Quartermain Special, which uh, one of her ancestors modified. Presumably a special body to make it a special, and it's a 59.43. You think it was a Christmas? sort of christening present I wish I had had. You probably had just a silver egg cup. <laughs> napkin ring, which I never used. Um, yeah, the Alvis Firefly Special. Good time for Trevor Hurst, 49.72. That's really good. What was his handicap? 51.5. That's good. Here's Robert Moore in the 3.3 litre GN Special. Is that Piglet? No, it's not. It's a GN Special, but it's got a 3.3 litre yeah, engine. Long stone of the, uh, the boys of that. This, this Class 11 is being sponsored by Louis Latour, who will provide the most excellent summer wines. A crate of those will keep you happily bubbling in your patio or your garden throughout the summer. The deep reds in late October. Is that Chateau Latour? No, this is Louis. Right. He's the one that was born out of wedlock. <laughs> Gregor Fiskin, great uh, dealer in exotic cars, delightful character, great driver in the Vauxhall OE has recorded a 50.49. He will drive that home. Uh, but do have a look if, on your way back to your car at his display in the car park. He's got a beautiful Squire, a beautiful 
uh, Type 57 Bugatti, a lovely Bentley. So if you're feeling flush, lots of people apparently have saved masses of money during lockdown and are looking to spend it. Well, what better way to spend it than on a Bugatti Type 57? And he also has the most wonderful exhibition at uh, Retrobile in France. Most magnificent stand, and he's always an extremely welcoming host on the stand. Just smile, and he'll let you in yep. and show you the beautiful cars. Rob Hubbard takes off in the Vauxhall H-Type 3098. Driven as ever with enthusiasm. There we go. Push it round. Come on, on. Come on the path. That's it. Attack, 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 Mr. Hubbard. Yeah, you have. That's good. Get the power going. Yep, there we go. Unleash that rubber band inside that box all and go for it. 44 miles an hour under the bridge and chucks it into the first S. Pulls it around the top right corner and heads for semi -sale. Now, will this be in the 40s? Not quite. I think it'll be in the very early 50s. We'll see in just a second. 53.69. Here's Mike Littlewood's very lightweight, special bodied Bentley with the 4.5 litre engine, litre chassis. family who might strip this out to make it their award in this particular class you know yeah Mike did a 53 one two and now what's he done is no the 53 one two was his second run Julian Bronson holds the general record in that wonderful machine that you don't often see Julian drove the Riley Blue Streak Special. That has the biggest superchargers I have ever seen on a car. Julian, Julian is a great store, great teller of stories as well. So if you were, if you were looking for people to uh, talk at... Uh, Prescott, you might think about asking him. I'd love to listen to that Bristolian accent for an hour and a half. He always has a big, big smile, which is great. He's a big, he's a big character in every sense. <coughs> Andrew Riggs, heading for the finish. That, that's the air balloon inside his, his, his racing suit. Uh, yeah. Matthew Roberts in the Morris Ford. Nice little concoction. Andrew Briggs finishes with a 53.33. Riley Special. And Liz Corley in Piglet is well on her way. Let's see what Matthew can do. He can do a 50.04. That's a good time. Here comes Piglet. It's interesting. Piglet needn't change down coming through and going through part. And all, all escalated in one gear. So it shows the power of that 3.3 Ford engine in it. Yeah, lots of torque from you. Of course, Dougal has lots of torque, but that's T-A-L-K <laughs> rather than D-O-R-Q-U-E. Is Liz Mrs. Dougal? 50.99 Here's the rapid OE box of 3098 of Christoph Owens with a very lightweight body exposed exhaust so much modified extra speed and certainly demonstrating it on Prescott for a time of 286 Here's the Riley Big Four Special with its two and a half litre four cylinder engine. Went on to power cars like the Healy Silverstone. I think most of the Healy's that before Austin Healy came on were powered by the big four cylinder Riley engine. My brother had a Healy Silverstone, which was a great touring car, not so, so quick enough as a competition car. 50.2 for Justin Hart. 
Now Slippery Anne, this delightful, almost new, I think it was only completed two years ago, Austin 7 Special with its fabric, Irish linen covered body, rear bodywork on an ash frame, rather like pre-First World War aircraft were made, and it's beautifully done. Mark is followed by this rapid Austin Ulster of George Scully. Mark Atkinson in Slippery Ann 69.26. George Scully, I think, will be considerably quicker and is with a 54.62. And it's followed by the Adro Special, and I'm ashamed to say I can't tell you anything about it. I'm sorry, Chris, I can't help you out on that. I think it's, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a genuine hill climb special in the period. It is. I think it's got a, a four and a half V twin jab engine. Most of them have them across the chassis. This one's got it four and aft. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, James Burmester is in the MGPA, which has been converted to a monoposter single seat. And Colin Rogers in the Adro has finished with the 55.64. And off the line, we'll see in a, sh in a second after we've seen the Monoposto MG is Matthew Blake's Grand Prix Amalcar single seater, supercharged M100. Rapid, rapid car, probably X Works or similar to the Works car. Look at that. That is something special. genuine Amalcar racing car, never designed, although it has got headlights, it was designed primarily for competition. And records a 53.93. Here's Peter Loxton in the very low riding Austin with a Fiat engine, engine similar to the one in the Fiat Balila. We we were going to have a Fiat Belila here. It was entered, but hasn't turned out to be shame. So I suppose the Belila was the Italian equivalent of the French BNC. Absolutely correct. We see so few of them at the BSCC, so maybe they're still tucked away in Italy somewhere. Probably. Peter, anyway, is finished with a 53.14. Nat follows. Famous. Chelsley special, the Nat. John Wiseman at the wheel. Built originally in 1919, modified in 1925 with the V-twin engine. GN chassis, as so many were. Chain drive. A lot of cycle cars were belt drive, which actually was kinder on the transmission than the chain. Chris, did it stretch a little bit like a rubber band occasionally, a bit like the, uh, the leather pre-selectors? The, the leather bands, did, yes. Um, the the Fiat Belilla, um, were, were they imported without bodies and the bodies were built over here? No. Oh, no. They had that lovely body with a little fin on the back. Yes, yeah, that's right. That was, yes. the works, that was the works body. Okay. And, and of course, uh, the, the importer was Werner Balls, wasn't he? I believe you're right. Here's Mark Purnell in the Supercharged Riley Special. Keep an eye on Prescott Facebook page and you'll get uh, Mark's story of his meeting at Prescott. He's going well. Let's just keep an eye on Gary Clare and Granny. But Mark has finished with the 4857, number 260. And uh, here comes Granny. Lifting up her skirts. Morgan front suspension. Ah, is it Austin 7 chassis? I 
don't know, but uh, of course the famous uh, V twin engine, followed by the Wasp, built by Jack Moore, driven by Winston T for many a long year. Great competitor is Master Winston. Yes, he is. Just loves it. Too. Yeah, and it really does. I love the, the rev car just sitting on top of the bonnet. <laughs> it's great. It's isn't good. It? Yeah, yeah it really is. And it's quick. Well, rounding semicircle of 41, 42, it'll be in the mid 40s, which is a brilliant time for the Wasp 45.4. And he's followed by Dougal in Piglet. Dougal driving with his usual exuberance. And of course now he is captain of the Fraser Nash team. First run 44.95, this time 45.4, so not as quick, Dougal's getting tired. We're focusing on the screen on James Surridge in his Riley 12.4 special. This class is sponsored by Octane, who I always think some have, have some of the finest photographs. They do. In magazine. And the good articles by the likes of Derek Bell. Absolutely and, right. And Jay Leno. Very, very always good. Always interesting. We, meanwhile, we've got Andrew Smith. This is a rapid, rapid car. Can he get in the 42s? Andrew's first run. Struggling to click it up. Was... 42, 43, no, sorry. 43, 43, 43 this 43. time. Yeah. Now then, Ben Fiddler in AGM1. ERA assembled by Tony Merrick from genuine ERA parts. Probably contains more genuine ERA parts than all the other ERAs. One and a half litre, oh, nice. Riley based engine. Nice approach to park too, very confident. And quick, 67 through the speed trap. Now Ben. Safety through, rolled up into semicircle. Hanging in on that tight white line all the way around. 44.09. A little bit slower than his first run. Andrew Craven, number 275. His first run was a 51.26. Wouldn't he love to be in the 40s? Not impossible. MG Riley, nice combination. Conditions are just a little bit chilly, are they not, for a, a record? I think that might be it. 50.67, just outside the 50s. Here's the Norris Special, the first of the Norris Brothers Special with its supercharged Engine, Meadows engine, I think. Correct, it is. And Andrew Wilson. It was restored by the boys only about 10 years ago, wasn't really? it? Really? So I guess the Norris brothers just left it in the corner and focused on the, the later special. Yep. Uh, he's followed by the Richard Bolster special in the hands of Tom Waterfield. Great tribute to Richard Bolster, the memorial to him. life, flying for the Royal Air Force in World War II. Great loss for his brother John. Tom is a great exponent of enjoying the maximum power out of this particular Bolster special. Well, it's a quick time as well, 45.83. His handicap was 47.5. So he's well inside his handicap. Here's Salome. Morgan GN, lovely mixture. Looks like a dragonfly it floating really across does. the surface. Wonderful control. Here we are behind GN Spider. I don't know how much uh, of uh, Salome is GN, but it's certainly Morgan from the suspension. His Spider, maybe the most famous Chelsea special of all time. Built by Basil Dam, Porsche 1923. 
took all sorts of records, won all sorts of hill climbs. I don't know whether he ever circuit raced. Have never seen any of the road horses that suggest that? I don't think so. It was just contained with you on your hill, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. That was his famous hunting ground. Spider, 49.22. Great to be in the 40s. Followed by Mike James's Riley, number 280. Here it is. That's a quick car. And very beautifully driven through the S's. Not hanging about. This will be in the mid 40s. It is 44.69. This is Tom Hardman's probably last climb in the MG Bellevue special here at Prescott. So we wish whoever's going to purchase this exciting car a welcome back. And we'll be interested to see what Tom puts his hands to with regards to the next hill climbs. Indeed, lots of detail on the back page of the programme. Offset single seater developed by Wilkie Wilkinson for the uh, Evans family. Bellevue Garage, you used to be able to rent the Bellevue Special. Now Charlie Martin really chucks the rip special. Great confidence, hasn't he, Charlie? <laughs> no. He really does. Yeah. Front wheels well off the ground, using every inch of the track, as one should. And it's always been entertaining. It's always been a very, very quick car. And Charlie records a 44.65. That's only one second or so off ERA times. That's fantastic. Robert Cobden, the supercharged 1500cc Riley Falcon Special, number 284. He broke it a couple of years ago, Logan. I think that's why we hadn't seen him for a couple of couple of years, certainly. This one. Pretty sure it was. Yeah. It's in good shape now, and it's my word, it's quick. Can he get it under the 40-second mark? Not quite. But he's up where he's up there with the ERAs with the 4374. Talking of which, here comes Terry Crab in R12C. First run of 4391 for Terry. Riley-based engine, pre-selector gearbox. As Nick said in the interview that I did with him, the way to get an ERA, ERA around the corner is to chuck it in and then floor the throttle and steer it around the corner on the throttle. Well, you can certainly do that on wide open spaces like Silverstone. I guess Nick knows that it works here at Prescott as well. 43.46 for Terry is half a second quicker than his first run. And Craven. Riley sharing this car with Andrew Craven, Andrew and Benjamin brothers, or father and son, I'm not sure which, I think father and son. Most nerve-wracking thing to watch your son driving a racing car. I did it once or twice. It's far more nerve-wracking than driving yourself. Benjamin, good run, 50.88. Now this extraordinary Alvis, uh, Austin 12-4 special of Rob Lewis looks like something from the turn of the century. And according to the program, it was actually concocted in 1928. It's a lot of fun. This particular class does produce a lot of fun, though, doesn't it? It really does. And he's followed by Rabel Rowe. Here comes Rabel Rowe, built by Mr. Orlebar. Consists of a GN chassis with an AC 2-litre engine, uh, but beautifully designed and put together. And Richard Archibald always has a great deal of fun in this car. 47.12. He's followed by Bob Druitt in this amazing Maggot, Austin 7 chassis, two V-twin engines, chained together, lovely and scruffy, and when they're chiming together it's okay, if one of them 
decides to stop, it rather spoils the mechanism. The engines are mag -en French V-twin mag engines, hence Maggot. He's followed by an even weirder vehicle, which we'll see pretty soon. Maggot finishing his run in 62.88. I can catch a glimpse of GN Aerial with its two aerial four-square engines. In other words, eight cylinders, aerial motorcycle engines geared together. hope that uh, one of them doesn't go on strike because that chews up the transmission. Do you think he woke up with a nut from a nightmare to put that together? I think he just found two aerial engines in a ditch somewhere and decided what can I do with these? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> now, classic. Uh, not a special, but very special. This is serotonic Vim in the lovely 2.3 litre Bugatti Type 35. Yes, he drove it on the road yesterday to arrive in the paddock for us. Really? Yep, totally. Yep. With lights and my guards or not even with those? I think, Probably it, not. I think it was naked. Lovely. And if you set them up right, beautiful steering and handling. <clears throat> so Sarah heads for the finish to be followed by... William College in the Wolsey Hornet Special, who is fishing for gears between Orchard and Pardon. Eventually finds the right one and off he goes. It is a, it is a Tony Sieba machine that he bought from them from about four years ago. Beautifully and immaculately prepared. Sarah in the Bugatti 60.91. Here's another Wolsey Hornet special following Tony Seaver. We'll just follow William College finishing his run. But the red one of Tony Seaver is a rapid vehicle. Do that, does it run on methanol or is that straight gas? I can't Please see look a at the acceleration of that. Wallop! I can't see an orange painted blob on the side which no, it I indicates can't. methanol. No. no, this is rapid. Is this going to put the frighteners among the ERAs? Well, it might Pool. tickle them closely. It might do. Forty-five, forty-three, pretty good. Jonathan Harrison is really enjoying cognac. Yeah, when Ron Footed had this car, he got it, um, and Freddie Giles had raced it for a long time. He took Freddie on Freddie's last race, i.e. he was in a race at Alton Park with Freddie Giles' ashes and as he went round he scattered the ashes so that Freddie Giles had his last race at Alton Park and I thought that was a, a lovely gesture. Better than being put into the cartridge for 12 board and shot her to the pheasant. Yeah, exactly. Here's Mac Hulbert. Ex R4D owner, but in this lovely Alva Silver Eagle, very rapid, very powerful special. Ma Mac is a great enthusiast for the Alvis brand. And this is pretty quick, 47.68. But in the meantime, this is young James Crab in Handyman. C, what can That's he just do? spoiled his run because he braked a little bit too hard, so lost a lot of momentum with regards to approaching to pardon. He'll be irritated with that. He'll miss out beating his papa. Terry did a 43 4 6. I'm not sure what James's first run was. He'd love to get it into the 42s. I think that little one mistake might penalise him. Might have cost him a bit. It's a 43.87. He's followed by David Pryke in one of the three single seater Fraser Nashes. Enviable piece of machinery, I think, between you and I, Christopher. Yeah, one. with the BMW, it would have originally had the Golf engine. Oh, I'd throw that away and start with that. This one it has now. This is the BMW engine. 
straight out of a BMW 328, reminding us that AFN, Fraser Nash, used to be the, the British importer for BMW. David Craig rounds semicircle 4677. Now, Ed Burgess had a fantastic run, for first run in, was it in the low 43s? Or maybe even in the 42s. 43.18. 43.18. <laughs> He's always enthusiastic. He doesn't hang around. It wasn't quite as tidy as he would have liked for Martin. That might have cost him that little bit of point. point, point. Ed has bought James Baxter's Gould GR55, a modern hill climb car with a Cosworth V8 at the back. So that'll be quite a contrast. And yeah, it's not as quick as before. 4461 for Ed Burgess. Ian Baxter is quick in the single seater Alta. Wonderful engine note coming down from you as he comes through the bridge. Yes. Alta engine. The woof does that power come on. It's yes. fabulous. And yeah. this is going, here we go. And Jeffrey Taylor, if he'd spent a bit more money on better materials, pre-war outers would have been much more reliable but nowadays they are because they've been properly built now can Ian get the best time of the day what's he facing 41.8 now is that best so far yeah, because I think he did 42.14 before lunch. Which means that Nick, I wonder if Nick knows that. Probably not. Nick Topless in R4D, the most famous ERA of all the X Works car, driven by Raymond Mays, driven by Ken Wharton, Ron Flockhart, Mac Halbert, of course, for a long time. Very wide approach to part. Yes, Nick knows his way around this car and around Prescott. It's not a day for record breaking. As I said, it's a bit What's he facing? A 41.8. A 41.8 by Ian Baxter. And it's a 42.3, half a second behind for Nick Topless. Now James Baxter in the ERA Riley. Are he and Ian related? No, they're not. Now then, James is really having a go in the ERA Riley. ERA engine in a Riley chassis. Great combination. And a very good driver. Very good indeed. It's a 40, no, it's 4254, which I think will give best time of day so far anyway to Ian Baxter. I can't see anybody who's going to threaten him. Here's Rodney Sieber sharing the family Wolsey Hornet special. And on the line, just leaving the line, is the second oldest Aston Martin of all, built in 1923. I think I made the mistake of saying 1913 last time. 1923, we'll watch the Wolsey Hornet over the line to record a 4589. Here's Razor Blade the narrowest and second oldest Aston Martin. Ian had a problem getting out of Harden last time. Brother said, chuck it in faster and you won't suffer fuel starvation. And indeed, Razor Blade is going well. They tried to break the record of Brooklyn's 100 miles in an hour. They failed because the tires kept coming off. But you can see why it's called Razor Blade. And the badge, the radiator badge, was the inspiration for the badge of the British Racing Drivers Club, the BRDC. So a historic car, and it's great to see it completing a run up Chelsea in 64.81. Closely followed by Rob Armstrong Wilson, but we've got a red flag. So Cecil Schumacher is being red flagged. What's happened to the Ford MP special of Rob Armstrong Wilson? We've got 
the GN Gypsy on the line, which I think will be switched off. And is that the MP Special coasting backwards out of the S's? Yeah, so Ian Chain finished okay. Rob Armstrong Wilson, the clock's still running. It looks as if he's had a mechanical problem. So I think he will be encouraged to come back down the hill. That's going to be the quickest way of getting him out of the way, I guess. I don't know if from the commentary box you can see what... Oh, there's Cecil Schumacher. He's going to... He gets out of the way. Looks like he's reversing from here. <laughs> yeah, I think he is, which is not an easy thing to do. And maybe he'll suggest that Cecil turns round and coasts back down the hill. Yes, I think that's the answer. Get Cecil Schumacher to do a three-point turn. If he can, do a three or four-point turn. And coast back down the hill. He'll get a rerun. But I'm afraid Rob Armstrong-Wilson won't because his is a failed run. That's a bit optimistic on the lock of the of his car. Clonked it into the wall, but no harm done. So here comes the MP Special. We'll be coasting back. Cecil will take the shortcut through the gate into the paddock, straight round probably to the to the paddock exit for his his next run. And luckily, well, it's a it's a mechanical problem. Luckily, not an accident, so the car isn't bent, but it's not functioning as it should. Okay, we're pretty much ready to go again. And on the line is the Tom Richardson in the GN with the Gypsy engine, Gypsy aircraft engine, GN chassis, Gypsy engine, I think we're designed by Frank Halford again. And powered all those de Havilland moths Leopard Moth in the late 20s, early 30s. So the red flags are coming in. The Gypsy engine will be started. And Tom Richardson will be on his way. 
He'll be followed by Robin Tolui, who's waiting in the pre-start line in the amazing Riley Manasco Pirate, which is a very rapid car as well. Well, it trounced everything at the BSCC meeting at Silverstone in a particular race this year. The gypsy engine is misbehaving. It's firing, but then stopping. It's just firing on one cylinder, and then... Well, at least you're not from 2,000 feet. Yeah, that's right. Well, do you know, we were listening to that story earlier on, weren't we? With Nick Toppis talking about... Uh, who was it flying in one of the stunt aeroplanes? Tony Ditheridge. What a story. Tell them, tell them that one. Well, I can't because we're just about to get okay. the um, GN Gypsy off the line. It's fired up. It's okay. And it's away, making proper aircraft noises. And it's 55 miles an hour under the bridge, which is pretty quick. Breaking hard for Orchard. And accelerates away from Pardon into the S's. First, cleared cleared the estate for Prescott. Yeah, I'll have a look at the old photographs in 1937. Have a look at that. 47.67 for Tom Richardson. Robin Tolui takes the Riley with its Manasco Pirate aircraft engine on its way. Big Riley chassis, powerful six-liter engine, which powered aircraft like the Curtis Jenny. Nicely handled through. Part. And Manasco, I'm pleased to report, are still in business making particularly airliner undercarriage. They, make, they made the undercarriage for the Boeing, for Jumbo Jet, the 747, and indeed for the Space Shuttle. So highly qualified and highly skilled engineering. Robin slides the Manasco Pirate round semicircle for a good time, 42.53. Excellent. That. No, he can't have beaten Baxter. Baxter was 41.80. 42.53 puts him into second or third place. Second or third. 42.54. Can Julian Jetway do anything in the Alvis Bad Norris special? It's always quick. It was always quick in the hands of Guy Smith. No, it's in the 43. It's 43.29. Still a pretty good time. And number 315, Mike Mars in the Napier Type 75, might be our last runner this afternoon. In the meantime, let's see how Julian gets on, 43.29. So the good note to finish on, this glorious Type 75 Napier with its 6.2 litre engine. Extremely appropriate, actually, to finish with that on the last run of the day. Yes, car from 1920. Napier, of course, was a was a big luxurious limousine, but chucked that body away. It's got a, a, a great power to weight ratio. So, Mike Miles with the Napier, saying farewell to Prescott for the moment, finishing with a 63.76. So that's the end of our competition runs. I think we might have a tour d'honneur, in other words, a, uh, a final climb by our best time of day, which is the Alta. Yes, we're going to have a tour d'honneur. Well, as he lived, harvest is, harvest did, 
his barley a fortnight ago. He can put away the uh, tractor and the harvester and uh, come out in his machine to receive an awarding clap from you all, which I'd I'm sure he would appreciate. Yes, Ian Baxter in this beautifully prepared and restored Alta Grand Prix car from 1930, 34, 35, 37 I beg his pardon, 1937, built by Geoffrey Taylor down in Surrey. It may be that we've got other cars coming up the hill. Often there's a, there's a tour de nerve by the fastest vintage car. Time, let's admire this interesting shape of Ian Baxter's Alta. We have a chance to look at it in the paddock, look particularly at the suspension, the rear suspension, which has double coil springs on a solid axle but no shock absorbers at all. And Ian says, despite that, it works. As you can see, it works extremely well. Can I can I just say, Chris, how tight it's been at the top? Because Ian Baxter did 41.80, and, and he's head and shoulders uh, uh, the fastest. But uh, Nick Topless did 42.32, Robinson Louis did 42.53, and James Baxter did 42.54, uh, unofficially, of course. Yes, those are scratch times, aren't they? Uh, yes, yes they are. And presumably that's what gets recorded for best time of day rather than a handicap time. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, but all those, we got them on the screen, all those uh, cars under 45 seconds and a lot of them and it's very close. Ed Burgess, particularly good run in his first run with the Type 51, a 43.18. So it brings us to the end of what Vintage Sports Car Club quite rightly called the jewel in their crown of annual events. Thanks everybody for those of you who've come. Thanks for watching online, if you're online, wherever you are. Thank you for your messages. We've had some lovely messages. And particularly thanks to our organizing team and our marshals and officials because the meeting has run pretty much without a pause. We finished at 4.30, which is unusually early. There will be prize giving, I guess, in the paddock pretty soon. And it's always nice if people come and attend prize giving and give a cheer to our winners. Thank you to Roger Rapson, Nick Upton, up in the commentary box up there. Breathing oxygen, it's pretty high. I'm Chris Druitt down on the start line. Don't forget that in a fortnight's time we've got uh, Vintage Racing at Mallory Park and at the end of September, last weekend in September, we are back here on the Sunday for the Vintage Sports Car Club long course meeting. Join us there in person or on screen. In the meantime, keep well and thanks very much for watching. Good night. Thank you, Christopher, for your input throughout the last two days. Always of value, full of amusement, and most importantly, excellent factual information. Mallory Park, let me just remind you, is on the 22nd of, of this month. That is the Bob Gerrard weekend or day. Loughton Park following that, and then as Christopher said, 25th of September, back here for the long course. Trophies and presentation will be in fact in fact in the clubhouse which is going to encourage you to come and use our brewery and our bar and uh, enjoy a, a civilized drink with us after this wonderful weekend. So please join us there and uh, as many of you would like to come will be welcome. Thank you marshals and thank you for spending the oxygen with myself up here in this little area over this weekend. Signing off, Nick Upton. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, it only remains for me to say, have a safe journey home, and uh, see you again soon. God bless. Bye for now.